Hi everyone, welcome to a brand new episode of Genre Equality. I'm Hitzer. I'm Hadi. I'm Isa. This month, we're going to be talking about the final season of Game of Thrones, the very divisive final season mm-hmm. of Game of Thrones. So we're going to unpack what it means, why people hate it, why some people defend it. Uh, I think amongst us, we have varying opinions as well about yeah. how it ended yeah. um, and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. But also, let's not forget, like despite Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. there is a ton of other great shit out there also, you know. So let's not uh, let our disappointments or defending or Game of Thrones take too much oxygen because, you know, we want to talk about things like uh, Tuka and Birdie and, and Doom Patrol and Legends of Tomorrow and what we do in yeah. the shadows, which are all equally... Um, Important shows Just not maybe as uh, Widely known mm-hmm. Or widely talked about yep. um, But We have to talk about Game of Thrones Because it is the most Important topic of the week the Important last, topic of the month Yeah yeah. The last episode got 19.3 million viewers Yeah And there's the legal ones only Yeah and, and plus it's just on the day off That's not yeah. even counting The the people the who watch on demand Demand yeah Yeah or, or stream later By HBO Go or something It's mad right It's mad yeah. and, and and much like Endgame last month We have to talk about it Just because it's clickbait AF It's yeah. bigger yeah, and because we are big fans also, la. Of course, of course, we've been yeah. following the show for about ten years now. Yeah, man. Um, so we do want to unpack what it means. But um, first of all, thank all of you guys. I think it was like one point seven k our record. Yes. Uh, listenership Woo! last month. One thousand seven hundred. Because of Endgame, la. I mean, yeah, Endgame. I can't really take credit for it. People just click on things that say Avengers Endgame. Endgame, correct. Yeah, I, as as do I. Like when I go on like yeah. Star or YouTube or Spotify. Oh, people talking about Avengers Endgame. <laughs> I'm gonna tune in. <laughs> And then three hours later. <laughs> three hours later, yeah. And and I'm and I'm sure we didn't say anything you haven't heard from a million other podcasts. Yeah, but I thanks agree. for listening anyway. Yeah. Um, let's begin, I guess, with Game the final season, season eight of Game of Thrones. Very divisive. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'm gonna let Hadi and Isa take most of this one because I feel you both have the most polarized, uh, <sighs> different opinions on it. And I'm probably gonna be somewhere in the middle, and I'm gonna jump in whenever okay, okay. I jump in. But I'm gonna begin by. Saying an analogy Or okay. telling you guys an analogy Like have you ever Met a friend on a bus yeah. And then you started telling You know an old friend like, Then you're, you're like catching up And then you're telling him Your life story and stuff yeah. And then you're like You know the first few Like half an hour is so In super great detail You know you're telling Oh man yeah I got married Or I got a kid now Blah 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 uh-huh. And then you notice Like your, your, your bus stop is approaching uh-huh. And then like the last few years Of your life Is oh just like God. On bullet points Oh okay 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 Yeah okay, that's okay. what like This last season of Game of Thrones okay. It feels like to me like, I was wondering where the fuck the analogy was going, but that's a good one. Yeah, because that's when I was watching this. That's what I felt like. Like if I'm telling my friend a story on the bus, and then like the last fucking five minutes, you're yeah, like, oh yeah, 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 oh yeah, I, I got married, I got ah, a kid, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, and okay, that okay, thing. Okay. Yeah, and you missed out a lot of the details. Yeah. A lot of the details, yeah, or the yeah, the nuance okay. of it, lah. And, and the ending to me just feels like bullet points, just like that. Okay. Um, on a macro level, if someone were to give me a synopsis in the broad strokes, fucking ten years ago, I don't think I would have any general problems with the turn, steam, twist, or character direction here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think my only issue with is is how sloppily it was executed sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and a, a lot of it is down to the truncated timeline. Yeah. Um, that's pretty much the the length and breadth of my thoughts on it. Um, I didn't hate the season as much as a lot of people did. Mm-hmm. I didn't think it was great either. Neither did I. Uh, but you know things like Danny becoming a tyrant. Always the end goal, I feel. Um, John ending up back in the north. Always the end goal. Mm-hmm. Arya becoming Arya the Explorer. Uh, also makes sense, you know. Things like that, like, They yeah. all, they all can be predicted. Mm-hmm. It's just how it was done. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, what did you guys think of uh, Game of Thrones? Shall we begin with the biggest apologist here for Game apologist, of Thrones yeah. o- over its last <laughs> couple I of? Okay, I mean it's fair to say that the last couple of seasons have been disappointing to fans. Yeah. Or had the most backlash amongst all the other seasons. Mm-hmm. Um Hadi would might disagree with some of it. So what 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 do you think? Well, uh I had a few issues with the previous season uh of Game of Thrones. I think you know we Seven, didn't yeah. yeah, we didn't make, um, there was no genre equality, equality back, back then, then. lah. But uh when we, we extensively talked about it and I was very concerned with the the jumping of the time. Mm. Uh you know, really Things that take weeks now are just in the matter of seconds, mm. that kind of thing. In this season, however, I felt that uh, I guess I was already used to it, or you know, the two year wait kind of like uh, it didn't disappoint me like, when I actually watched the entire season. Okay. Um, there were obviously issues that I, everybody has been talking about for the past few months, lah. Mm. Uh, past few weeks, sorry. Yeah. Can't be months yet. Um, I guess if you include season seven, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, where it's just going on about um, 
the 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 illogical moves of like why do you have the night king and all he does is die mm. you know that kind of like um big big um problems la. failure oh, to pay off la. sorry spoilers spoiler la? i mean it's it's, it's a show la, and yeah it's past the statue okay series, good so i think it's so, fine yeah, yeah so you know like the night king dying brand getting the the, the kingship mm. uh how uh, cersei didn't get the carpens that uh, people would think that she deserved um and all these other issues but i felt that I think although I mean to defend them lah, yeah. not not to say like I liked it, but I think like the show has consistently subverted payoffs lah. In a way, yeah, oh, yeah. Since yeah. the since the very beginning, so I don't know why people find that that surprising. Yeah, yeah, something like that, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and I feel that no matter what we are going to say next, right? Mm. We are. This is definitely a polarizing season. 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 Yeah. Um, and one thing that I could. Also, add on is that the production is still there, lah. It is still top quality stuff, lah. Mm. You know, uh, and your creative choices. The thing that I I I got was that I understood the creative choices that uh the the the, the two guys made. Yeah, yeah. 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 Benny Hoff and Wise. Benny Hoff and Wise, yeah. And I felt that, like you know, having an episode where it's really dark, mm. you know, really added to the atmosphere of. Of what they were trying to get across, lah. You know that mm, it was an intentional stylistic choice yeah. to make it look like a horror set piece. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that you can you you barely see anything. You 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 you're scared. You mm. you are you're always on a run, lah. You know, mm, they are trying to immerse you in the reality of that situation, finding a uh, fighting a nighttime war. Yeah. yeah, and all we saw were memes of everybody turning up the brightness on their TVs. Yeah, you know, yeah, which sort of, sort of like kind of flew over their heads, like What was intended? Which I felt was a bit sad, lah, because you mm. didn't get to really. You know, really chomp on the the what what beauty of Fifty Five Nights were like, lah. But I mean, what you're gonna do? That's GOT fandom in a nutshell. When Ed Sheeran popped up, right? They totally missed the point of the scene, humanizing Lannister soldiers. Yeah, they just they're just normal people, and they yeah. just kept harping on, oh, why is like Ed Sheeran? He's here? such a bad actor. So I mean, uh, GOT fandom, like with most great big fandoms like Star Wars and all that, la. it's not just toxicity, but just because of how many people there are, there's bound to be a lot of stupid people in there. Yeah, yeah. But again, I had not much concerns on um, the third. Mm. Of Danny, I felt that it was a very logical choice. No, how is that? How is that? Is the issue? But yes, yeah. I know. But yeah. that one, and the thing is, I agree with a lot of people when say, "Yeah, it's just you didn't feel it. You're not. You're supposed to feel that turn. You know, you're mm. going to be, oh shit, she turned. Yeah, you just didn't care. Yeah, you know. But then it was still logical. Brand being king, that one. Uh, I don't. Mm. Yeah, I also have my gripes on that. Mm. But in the end, okay lah, it worked out lah. You know, I'm just glad that it's done. It's over, and I can move on in my life. Mm. Yeah, fair yeah. 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 Um, let's take it over to Aisa. Ooh, where do we begin? Where do we begin? Uh, my biggest question, I think, for season eight, right? Um, I started to notice that from, well, obviously, same same kind of concerns. Season seven onwards, the moment you start ignoring, uh, time, right, yeah. is a major factor. Given that for six straight seasons, you've always respected how long it freaking took Danny to cross the ocean, how long it takes you to get from King's Landing to the North, and all of those things, right? Are painstakingly noted, mm. right? In in the whole thing, and then because you have this f- ending in mind that you need to rush towards, to you said, okay, we're gonna cap it, we're gonna do half seasons now, we're gonna do longer episodes, right? Uh, you know, you start ignoring all these things, and I think mm. that for me was the first kind of indication that it, things were gonna start going downhill. Mm. Like for example, how long it took Danny to fly and save John, mm. right? Uh, like immediately that Seconds. was like a. Y- yeah, la, like, but I mean, in, in show time, it took it like took days la, or weeks, la, but in from our perspective, yeah, it yeah, feels yeah. seconds. Yeah. Yeah, so it didn't have that kind of impact. It didn't mm. have that weight, you yeah. know, to the, to, to the whole idea of like needing to hold out against an army and you're stuck on an island and mm. you know, the mode, you know, and all, all those things are great. Uh, I do agree that the pr- largely the production value has been there are still it still has, a, has its moments, right? Mm. Uh, there are still very, very beautiful things. Uh, I think Drogon has, has looked better than he's ever looked uh, with good reason I guess yeah uh, I think a lot of the budget went to that yeah mm. for sure and you know Drogon should probably win best actor for the <laughs> entire series uh, with, with this with this um, with this season uh, but my biggest question is so what right mm. like I understand that you have limitations I understand that you've set a deadline for yourselves and you need to hit specific plot points in order to kind of wrap it up as neatly as possible mm. but so what 
Yeah, yeah. the right. deadline is self-enforced. Uh, because uh, that's what I was gonna say. It was a self-enforced deadline. Yeah, uh, because Star Wars, they have to start filming. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I mean, uh, I understand those things, yeah. right? But that doesn't make me like any happier as a viewer. Mm. You know, uh, if, we, if we can, we can talk about Episode Three and how dark it was, right? I understand the stylistic choice. I understand all of that. But if that many people can't see jack shit, right? Then what's the point? Like, there's a difference between it being dark and hits the right note with it being immersive and mm. scary and horrible. But if it's not planned for and you're not, like, catering to a specific audience, and we're not even talking about, like, guys who aren't paying for HBO and things like that. You know, we're talking about HBO viewers mm. who are streaming this, mm. who can't see anything on their, on their TVs. On their laptops right? or something. On their, or their laptops, mm. for that matter, right? You alienate a huge bunch of people. You create its own for a... Which I guess probably helps the entire thing because people are going to watch it the second time round, right? Yeah. Just to kind of catch the entire thing. But so many plot points, like, it's it's one of those classic things about, like, you need to show and not tell. Mm. And it felt a lot like a lot of telling me, like, this mm. and that, right? Like, Bran's entire arc with him becoming the third Eye Raven, and then he becomes this smarmy little fuck at the end of it, mm. right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the whole idea of him not being human anymore, right? Mm. Or being less yeah, that human is. and more you know um, supernatural or preternatural however you want to put it like suddenly becomes summed up in his one stupid ass line what do you think I came all the way here for mm. right um, like I have no issue with Bran becoming king but I have issue with the way that it was done mm. like where is the politics mm. where is the fighting mm. where My- is the motivations of each and individual character that we have followed for so long, right? I'm like, they, <laughs> they are given but in very broad strokes. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, it's not even broad strokes. Sometimes it's just ignored, like, yeah. on it, uh, just overall, right? Because Tyrion says that it should be that way, it should be that way. It just doesn't make sense. Or it's expected for the viewer to just imply by himself based exactly. on past characterization. Uh. So, like, a lot of people have been saying foreshadowing is not character development. I, uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. but th- see, the problem is is that they ignored so much past characterizations that you can't fall on that anymore. Mm, yeah. Very early in this season, mm, especially. Yeah. Right, so if we, if we look, especially if we look at episode four, so many out of character things, right? Like, like we talk about the whole revelry and how people are out of their heads, they're partly grieving, they're trying to have fun, they're trying to let off steam, but that does not and should not undo years and years of writing a character a particular way, mm. right? How do you subsume Brienne's entire character arc into simply being a Wikipedia entry for Jamie, mm. right? That troubles me a great, great deal, and I'm, I mean, I understand. Sure, there are limitations, yeah. but still, really, yeah. especially when it's a self-enforced thing. Like it needed two more episodes mm. for this to feel a bit more fleshed out, mm. right? I'm okay with Danny's turn. I'm okay with the very honestly slipshot idea of what a uh, carpet bombing King's Landing should look and feel like, mm. right? Because like fire isn't like a one-time thing. You stand in fire and you die, right? It spreads, right? You shouldn't be seeing. So I have a lot of issues, like clearly, right? Mm. Uh, but at the end of the day for me is that I have so many more things and questions that I would have liked to at least have seen mm. asked again or reinterpreted again. I don't need the answers for that, right? Mm. But what was the, why did the Night King, well, what was the Night King's motivation? Why did Bran have his powers? Like, why did Danny turn? All of these things need to be shown and not told. And that's my biggest issue with season eight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would argue that a lot of the character development that has been done in previous seasons has been done over travel. Like yeah. when you're on the road, when you're on ships, you know, a lot of the getting from point A to point B is not just traveling. It is character development, people talking in small rooms, talking you scenes, know. Uh, so yeah. there, there wasn't enough of that to justify specific tense. La. Like, you know, for example, what Jamie did to help Brienne in season three. Or season four, I forgot what it was, you know. When when his actual face turn happening, I'm sorry for a wrestling term. But yeah. like when his face turn was happening, right? Um if you told me that in broad strokes, I'll be like, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit with Jamie's character at the point. But you did that slowly. You had a character they moments. Had to travel. You had to travel, yeah. he had this he had to talk to with Brian over ex- an extended period of time, that type of thing. Like, then you start to believe the turn, you know. Mm-hmm. So there was that was lacking. Like, um, from definitely from a writing standpoint, for sure. I think on every other level, the show, weirdly enough, is actually the best it's ever been on a technical level. Like from the camera work to the costuming to the music to the acting, uh, this has been some of the best, one of the best Game of Thrones seasons to date. Actually, like, it just f- failed somewhat on a writing level. Um, but that's, that's the problem, also, right? Yeah, so you know, because the... writing is the foundation. Everything else is just window dressing. Yeah. You see, um, although I mean, admittedly, right? Also in 
slight defense of Benny Hoff and Weiser at D&D. I went back to read old interviews, right? And and they clearly stated that they, they never signed up to write an ending for A Song of Ice and Fire. Mm. They were clearly, at the beginning, under the assumption that George R. R. Martin would finish this shit yep. in the 7 to 10 years that they would do the show. Yep. And they'd be like, okay, fine, then we'll adapt the ending. Lah. So they never signed up to make up or to end George R. R. Martin's thing. Or to get just a summary. Correct, yeah. So yeah. they did the best they could with the summary. Uh, and they made up some things on their own that wasn't given to them. But in fairness, uh, they signed up for an adaptation. Yeah. And towards the end, they were forced They ran to, out of adaptations. Yeah, they, they, they were forced to come up with something and yeah. to finish someone else, else's and, work. Uh, yeah, and I feel that this is not also George R. R. Martin's fault. Mm. I mean, as a writer, it's up to you how long you want to take. You know, it is, you know, your writing process. Sure. Mm. So, and it ju- it's just that, yeah, la, behind the scenes, these things happen. La, Correct, you know? yeah. You know, some of the, uh, some of the best... Series finales, for example, with, with, like we, I've talked about like um, like Mad Men, you know, with yeah. Matthew Weiner and Vince Gilligan or Breaking Bad, things like that. That that was their own vision, you see. Yeah. So they got to accomplish it because they had uh, thought about it for a long time. It was their idea. Benioff and Weiss, this wasn't their, their idea. Mm-hmm. They no. they signed up to translate something from page to screen. And a, a majority of the time, they did a damn good job. When they when they were forced to adapt what was already there, they did a hell of a job. Yep. Right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, they did. So they failed when it was just they were basically left to their own devices, la, which yeah. is isn't fair, lah, because it's not what they signed up for. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um. Also, I mean, I understand they want to hurry off to Star Wars. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to hurry off to Star Wars? <laughs> oh, oh man. Uh. But you know, I'm just trying to say they're mitigating circ- circumstances, yeah. Yeah. and also, I would just like to say I dislike the season. Not as much as a lot of people, but I disliked it. Mm-hmm. But I do, over the course of my job, watch over like 300 different shows a year. Yeah. Um. So in that span, right, I get to see the best of the best and the worst of the worst. And there are a lot and of worst of the worst. This is nowhere near the best of the best and this is nowhere near the worst of the worst. Middle uh. ground? So a lot of people in their uh, uh, excitement to get clickbait, right, would like to proclaim something to be the best thing I've ever seen. Oh man, this is rubbish, this is trash, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. I would just like to restore some perspective that is neither, it falls somewhere in between yeah. and there are mitigating circumstances. Yeah. You have to understand on certain levels, on a technical level, costuming, music, uh, effects, things like that. I mean, this has been the best season. Yeah, I mean, been. the last two actually. Mm-hmm. It's just that everything else has fallen off. But that's what they had to resort to because they didn't mm. really have much writing left. Mm. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Also, I do have to say that no show should be judged on its ending. Yeah. Like, you can't... You, just because something has a bad ending doesn't retroactively erase all the wonderful moments that have come in the years prior. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, it's a bit unfair to say that you wasted 8 years of your life or you nah. wasted 10 years of your life when 70 to 75% of the, that time, they gave you some of the best television that's ever been. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think, like, in conclusion for Game of Thrones, for me specifically... Um, this isn't a How I Met Your Mother situation where the ending totally invalidated everything that came before. <laughs> I mean, sorry to bring non-genre things, but I think hey, How I Met Your Mother was the worst case scenario for how you erase all the goodwill that you yeah. had. I don't think Game of Thrones is at that level. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, man, it's, it's hard to judge this season on that, but mm. because of that, I would rate it a 6 out of 10. The show as a whole, though, is an 8 out of 10. Like, the show... In all, in, in all, it, yeah. from season one yeah. to season eight, if you're gonna judge it as a whole, I think it's an eight out of ten. It's still one of the greatest shows ever made, mm. And just because it it didn't stick the landing, doesn't mean like all the flip they did in mid yeah, yeah, didn't yeah. count. Yeah, know? of course. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, how would you rate? Last question: How would you rate this season, at what and why, and how would you rate the whole show holistically? I I mean, I'll give it. Okay, this is a bit of a cheat lah. Yeah. I'll give it about a seven for this season. Mm. Um, I'm I'm still taking away points for you know. The, Still, the quality of the writing was a bit shoddy, but again, props to you know everything else. Uh, I had fun, mm-hmm. you know, and I look back with uh, with good memories lah, you know, of the, the past ten years now. So the entire series, you know, I'll give it an I agree with you lah. And it, it it sounds about right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I so I think for me, it, it's a valiant attempt, yeah. right? It's a valiant attempt at something that, quite honestly, at the end, you could see they didn't really care much about. The show anymore. Or they didn't know how to Or they didn't know how to yeah. You know And there are more pressing things On their minds Sure mm. So uh, I mean This season I would still give it a 6 Right It's still a recommend for me Just because Like like Hardy put so succinctly Right Watch it and get it over and done with yeah. Right So that you can look back On the entire length and breadth Of what Game of Thrones Has been and has meant to people Right And then you can take a really good look At it 
you know and we can always uh, um, we can always like oh you know they should have they could have and all the what ifs but it is what it is at the end of the day and mm-hmm. I would still give overall everything it's an 8 for me mm-hmm. yeah I mean the show as a whole sort of brought back the event television uh, aspect to TV which hasn't been around in a long time especially since uh to be honest, since cable took over and then now with streaming yeah. and how everything is kind of spinted off into niche audiences, there will never be another show like Game of Thrones because Game of Thrones recaptured the whole, like, we all got to watch the Seinfeld finale together, we all got to watch the Friends finale together, we all got to watch Dallas and MASH and uh, Whatever, like, yeah. things of that ilk, yeah, like, you know, yeah, yeah, big, yeah. everyone gets together, we buy dinner and then we watch on a big screen, hoop and holler, complain together. So, uh, that, that's, this is the last show that will ever do that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess appreciate it while you can, like, and don't diss it too much for how it didn't stick the landing. Yeah. Which I totally agree, it did not stick the landing. It did not, now. Yeah. yeah. Like, Even I have to agree with that. The, 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 the most apologist of all of Game of Thrones, yeah. You know? Yeah, even even Hardy disagrees yeah. that they didn't stick the landing. So, but I still loved it. Love is a strong term. No, in, as is hate. <laughs> I know that's. A, but as a whole, you're as saying a whole, as a I show. Think, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, me myself in particular. If you know how big of a Sopranos fan I am. Yeah. Do you know how terrible, how terrible those the are, ending was? Those last two or three seasons were. Yeah. The the X Files. Oh my god, the love I have for the X Files. But goddamn, the the mythology laden last season was terrible. You know. Yeah, know. But in the end, like over time, people get perspective and they remember the good times, lah. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Hey, do you remember the mountain crushing his head? You know, that thing. Oh man, it was good times. Something like that. The great wedding. You know, you talk about that. Yeah, man. Wow, what a shocker. That kind of thing, lah. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, R.I.P. Game of Thrones. I did not watch the documentary. Uh, wrap up. Did you watch it? I did. How How was it? It's good. Was good. Was it was it more closure than the, uh, than yes, the ending game? Yes, it's definitely more closure. You, you know, you get to the, the it was in, a tribute, yeah, lah. You know, yeah, to the, the inside look at the entire thing really did help, right? Because yeah. it's not just the story of Game of Thrones; it's about the story of all the people involved yes, in Game of correct. Thrones, and that from the me, actors yeah. to the crew to the writers to everybody who was involved, and it was nice, lah, to see what a family they have become now over mm. the past ten years. Mm. You know, and and yeah, it's always nice. But that's the only thing that that kind of like. Makes you l- less yeah, it, hateful it towards it, yeah, what happened. It made it a, a, yeah. a bit better. Takes the edge off, lah. Mm. Takes the edge off. Yeah. I mean, I guess it was it was smart for them to yeah, release yeah. a documentary. I mean, la. that's what they've been doing. You know, they have the, the, the BTS things after every episode. Oh, is yeah, aired. The top. yeah. So all that has been helping to like. So I, yeah. so much context to a particular episode is actually given in the inside the episode. Yeah, you know, which is problematic. <laughs> which yeah. is the problem itself. Yeah, I know. Where, where I got like a lot of the feeling and emotion and what they intended to deliver. Then like, oh, fi- okay, okay. <laughs> fire them telling me rather than the show actually showing me is weird, la. <laughs> It is. It is. It yeah. Is. So like when I hear the thought processes, I'm like, ah, oh, okay, I get that it makes now. Sense, yeah. yeah. But then like it didn't come across in yeah. your work, so it doesn't really count, bro. Yeah, I know. I feel that the the, the sorry, I I know I'm extending this a bit more. No, it's okay. But it's the, our major topic. Yeah. Yeah, but getting rid of not getting they didn't get rid, but George R. R. Martin leaving the production mm. uh, a few seasons ago might not have been the best thing also la. I felt that his he- I just guess creative differences also la. Mm-hmm. You know, he's seeing his baby created in one way and they want to go another way and you know. Yeah. yeah. Even George also didn't really like the season apparently. Mm. Yes. But see it's convenient for him to not like it. Yeah. yeah, I guess. Because he can write it however the fuck he wants. That's though. true also. I know. And it's yeah. also unfair because he gets to see the missteps and then he gets to correct it also. That's true also. You know. <laughs> who, who knew how much of that final episode or final season was part of his summary? Yeah, uh, I exactly. agree. Yeah. 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 And now he gets to retroactively change it. It's a bit unfair to say that George Herr Martin is like, oh, super flawless. No, no, of course not. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that he should have been involved more. Yeah. Maybe that would have helped. I mean, as, with the as writing. A, as, a guiding, as a writer, like as, as a consultant or a guiding principal, yeah. or uh, one of the lead writers also, you know, mm. that might really help. Yeah, yeah, or you know, I mean, it could be good if he actually did get around to writing his books. Yeah, I know. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but to be fair, right? If let's say all the books are out, right? Yeah, Game of Thrones would be like thirteen seasons long. Sure. Yeah. 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 Sure. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't mind that. It's it feels like they needed at least three episodes, if not three more seasons. Yeah. To really tell the full story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, but it's electing Brand King alone could have been a season. That's true. Yeah. yeah. How to get to that point, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, uh, oh well, okay. I mean, uh in the end, like I gotta shout out um guys like Peter Dinklage and stuff. Like, some of the most phenomenal acting I've seen on television uh, came on the show. I agree. That's you know, true. things like that. And even some of the people who've been under under praise, like Kit Harrington and Emilia Clark, I thought brought tried to try their best to give weight. Uh, to the season mm-hmm. yeah. mm-hmm. when the words mm-hmm. didn't back them up la. yeah that's Definitely. true I, I, I especially feel like we were just noticing um, I was watching one of the episodes with my brother um, second last episode so episode 7 right and he was just like 
how much of Peter Dinklage's role requires him to be in a room talking. Yeah. That's the majority of his role. Yeah. And I think it's a testament to how great an actor he actually is, right? To have yeah. to nail those scenes time mm. and time and time again. Yeah. Because there's so much of it is conversation driven. Yeah. You know, as opposed to action driven. Yeah, I mean, Jon Snow gets all the big battle episodes, so he stands out, right? Mm-hmm. Tyrion gets all the small room. Uh, let's plot and scheme. But he stands out that way. He stands out that way. Indeed, mm. indeed. Uh, yeah, I guess that's all we have to say for Game of Thrones unless you guys have any parting now, thoughts. I'm, I mean, I'm going to miss it lah. I am going to miss it as well. Yeah. It, it's, it was event television and we will never see the likes of them again. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's watch has ended, I guess. It, oh, no, that's a good one to end. Okay, let's move on. Okay. Uh, next up, we'll be talking about a brand new show on Netflix created by Bojack Horseman animator Lisa Hannawalt uh, called Tuka and Bertie. It's a new animal-themed comedy. If you recall, a few episodes ago, I glowingly reviewed Lisa Hannawalt's graphic novel Coyote Dog Go. Um, I think she's a talent that is, uh, I think, very highly of her, uh, given her body of work, you know, both Bojack Osman and her, her comic books, and now with Tuka and Bertie. Uh, her new comedy stars two fantastic comedians in Tiffany Haddish and Ellie Wong mm-hmm. as their principal uh, voice actors for the titular characters. Uh, basically, they're two bird women who are best friends. They live in the same apartment building, and the show follows their lives as millennial anxieties and manic misadventures uh, overwhelm them. Yeah. Uh, it's it's <laughs> essentially Broad City animated like Bojack Horseman. Yeah, is what I would much. say. It's it's pretty much Broad City. Like, and if you're a fan of either Bojack Horseman or Broad City, you would love the show. Um, in terms of si- setting and style, obviously, as I mentioned, it looks a lot like Bojack Horseman because Lisa Hannawalt is the principal animator for Bojack Horseman. Mm-hmm. Uh, thanks to this, you know, anthropomorphic. Oh my god, it's so difficult to say that word. Anthropomorphic animal Go characters. Under. Yeah, plus some talking plants as well, which yes. is new. Uh, and uh, you know, an unabashed love of puns. Um, <laughs> but Bertie works at a company called Condé Nest, which is just I still like R O L F R O F L every time I hear Condé Nest. You know, um, it's an amazing pun. But in terms of tone and dynamic, like I mentioned again, it's straight up the spiritual sequel to Broad City. Now that Broad City has ended, this mm-hmm. is what millennial women can watch, right down to the introvert extrovert best friend dynamic. Um, I think this show is more than anything about the joys and struggles of female friendship. And its humor is mined from a mix of, you know, like feminist issues, like yeah. sexual harassment, or more universal ones like uh, the dread of long term relationship or growing old into your thirties, which, as all of us who are growing into our thirties, early thirties now, can kind of relate to. Although we're not women, you know, uh, the humor is sharp. It's very loud. Yes. Uh, it's it's <laughs> mild a minute like Bojack, but it also goes for great drama once you get into the inner lives of these characters, lah. Um, what did you think about this, uh, Isa? Who you have completed the show as well? Yes, I have. Um. First of all, can I just say that I'm very surprised that Ellie Wong's yeah. role is very muted from what we are used to seeing from her. Somebody and has to play the straight woman to Tiffany Haddish who is loud by nature. Yeah, who is yeah. loud by nature. So I felt like Tiffany Haddish had to play it up, right? Like yeah. she's even louder than and even larger than life than we usually are yeah. as, as Tuka. But uh, Ellie Wong's performance as Bertie w- was surprising. I didn't expect it to be like that, especially when I went into it knowing who the two comedians were. Yeah, you watch her stand up and, and everything. Uh, yeah, it's very exactly different, right. And yeah. like, uh, I I enjoyed that yeah. because I think it shows a great deal of range from her that we haven't seen uh, all the way through. Uh, but I think you've covered like the major points of that. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, sometimes extremely absurdist in the way that it approaches things. It almost feels like a fever dream. Sometimes, yes, it yeah. does. It really, really does. It, it really just feels like you know Tuka went on a on a binge, right? And we're just kind of like seeing <laughs> the effects of that. Um, all in all, I I like how it looks like BoJack Horseman, but the tone and the vibe of it is totally different, mm. right? And like the it's writing, more city, like, and yeah, it has a more, more female point of view. Yeah, yeah it definitely does. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. I think that little point of contrast for me mm. really made the writing stand out a lot more mm. because yes. I'm so used to seeing that animation style and I associate it immediately with Bojack. With Bojack. Yeah. So just kind of like, is uh, is Coyote Girl, right? Um, Coyote Dog Girl, yeah. Yeah, Coyote Dog Girl. Yeah. Tonally, is it the same as Tuka and Bertie or does it take on a different tone as well? I'm tonally, humorly, uh, humorly, uh, in terms of comedy, uh, yes, it is the same, but it's more of a Western and it's, it's kind of like... Uh, this show mixed with Deadwood, weirdly enough. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a bit more gruesome and graphic in Coyote.Girl. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm a fan. I'm definitely going to go check out Coyote.Girl. I, have, yeah. I haven't had time to read that yet. But uh, yeah, I really enjoyed mm. this season. Uh, I give it a good recommend. I will give it a 7 out of 10. 7 out of 10, yeah. Um, I think particularly the backstory behind um, Tuka's former alcoholism and current sobriety, um, I think it forms the crux of the hidden pathos that's underneath the wild absurdism that is there. Yes. As well as some unresolved trauma from Bertie's childhood that 
kind of forms the foundation of her adult insecurities. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That's the most harrowing the show gets. It doesn't get as depressing as Bojack does. Yeah. Uh, but I can see it going in that direction because even Bojack first season didn't go as dark it, yeah, as it would sure. lead to. Yeah. For sure. do, do you hope that it will? I don't know. I think I hope that it balances it. Okay. For sure. Um, I think like besides its themes, um, I really really enjoyed the bright and lovely visuals. One mm. of his biggest strengths, brighter than Bojack is. Yes, for sure. Um, Henwalk style, like you said, like it's, it's like a fever dream kind of soundtrack to club music. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's surreal. It's surreal. Um, every inch of the frame is actually very detailed and deliberate. Tuka and Bertie is sort of designed to encourage multiple viewing, so you can spot all the background quirks mm. and, and pause to laugh at all the blink and you will miss it jokes. Yeah. Uh, this is a cartoon for grown ups. Uh, let me say because you know I'm. I wouldn't recommend kids watch this at oh, all no, not, yeah. because of its casual depiction of the female anatomy which is um, I guess empowering in of itself because it lets girls be gross and kind of reclaims female sexuality from the male gaze Yeah. Uh, but also because of its extraordinary sensitivity when it deals with issues like office simulations and yeah. uh, existential anxieties and complicated relationships mm. and especially when you find out what some of their backstory is mm-hmm. it's, it's pretty yep. it's pretty dark la. Um, you rated it a 7 I'm going I'm actually like super high on this show so yep. I'm, I'm giving it an 8.5 nice all to go yeah so I really loved it uh, next up we have uh, DC's Universe DC Universe's latest show yeah uh, if you don't know DC Universe is a streaming app uh, that is just exclusive to DC as its title implies <laughs> it has previously released Titans which turned out to be really good despite the That's horrible fun. trailers yeah. It uh, turned out Young Justice, which we reviewed also, we which we also, also. liked. Yeah. And with Doom Patrol, I think they are three for three. Yep. You know, yep. as unlikely as Titans would have been, uh, this is their third show. And this, more than any of the other two shows, is a home run. Yeah. Um, I'm really in love with this show. Just going to say straight up. Uh, it's, it's, I think this is my most highest rated show this month. Um, I already dug their vibe when they introduced when they were introduced on Titans in yeah. episode four, yeah. right? Which kind of functioned as a backdoor pilot, pilot of correct. sorts, right? Yeah. But from there, they obviously made a few tweaks. They recast Timothy Dalton as the chief, mm-hmm. which I think is an improvement. Yes. And voila, the show was even better. Um, there's kind of a freewheeling sense of boundless experimentation and radical inventiveness at every turn. Yep. It kind of feels like the love child of like Brian Fuller's Pushing Daisies, you know, that whimsical yeah, yeah, ec- yeah. eccentricity with Charlie Kaufman's self-aware metafiction. Like adaptation. Yeah, something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, with Mr. Nobody's narration and yeah, all of that. Um, you know, he exists in the white space, which is a space that exists in between, in between panels. Books, yeah. yeah, it's fucking clever, right? Um, uh, it rivals and perhaps, I think, su- Trying to surpass Legends of Tomorrow as DC's weirdest live action show, and I enjoy this little war between them right now. <laughs> like they're trying to out bizarre each other, which yeah. is amazing. Because we love both. We love both, yeah. Um, it, but one thing is for sure, it's certainly just as fun. It it's is. in a very different way. Yeah. Um, more than its to- tonal flourish, though, there's a depth and tragedy to its nuanced treatment of its characters. Yeah. That gives the emotional substance to its elastic style. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, it draws a lot from Grant Morrison's run specifically, but I think the show does does him justice, lah. And and more than Legends of Tomorrow is the emotion that makes me rate it higher yeah. than Legends because it delves deeper into who these people are, what yeah. makes them tick, or the trauma that's that's been there. Uh, Legends does a lot of things well. It doesn't make me cry. Um, Doom Patrol <sighs> gave that to me. You know, it made me tear up on several occasions, lah. Uh, but you know It's just bizarre like, To talk about it is. Um, There were episodes Set in an alternate dimension Inside the donkeys But, but um, They went back in time To start a religion To create a god uh, To counter another god and To counter another god uh, There's something as weird As the animal Vegetable mineral man uh, yeah, Who is a, yeah. a man with a second Velociraptor head Made up of bodies Made of minerals And limbs made of Fruits and vegetables yeah. Or there's Beard Hunter Who is a guy Who can be bonded Through someone Through by, space and time yeah. By eating their beard Yeah there's like Flex Mentello Who is a muscular man Who can alter mo- molecules And reality When By he flexes his flexes his muscle Yeah On different types of muscles Different types of muscles yeah. There's a scene Where an entire town Orgasms simultaneously Because he flexed The wrong muscle Yeah Uh <laughs> I mean, in the finale, there was uh, like a disembodied Chumba Wamba singing tap thumping throughout the whole episode. Yeah, there was like Easy Q, the cockroach, who's also like a lunatic Christian fundamentalist, who's a who, self-prophesized prophet. Yeah, and he later falls in love with Admiral a Whiskers, rat? who is a rat filled with vengeance because his mom was killed by one of the Doom Patrollers. Yeah, spoiler alert, you know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, there's a long. Gr- long, gross, that's but very funny scene when the rat and the cockroach make out with each other, yeah, which kind of forms the set piece of the finale. Yeah. I have never seen a cockroach and a rat make out. Yeah, make sense. It made sense. And it lingered. Yeah, it did for a long time. It, it made sure to show the tongue and everything. Yeah, I didn't know rats had that long tongue. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, this is among other weird and wonderful things that yeah, they show yeah, yeah. on a regular basis, lah. But even after all that, I did still didn't think they would dare ad- adapt uh, Danny the Streets, yeah, but they did, you know, they because did. Danny the Street, if you don't know, is a living sentient gender queer street, and they made something as weird and absurd as that, very heartbreaking, very poignant. Yeah. Absolutely and beautiful story about a safe haven for homosexuals, trans- transgenders, drag queens, whoever or ad- didn't feel, or know. any frightened minority that yeah. seeks acceptance. You know, and it's a beautiful episode about Larry's homosexuality mm-hmm, uh, and mm-hmm. his shame about feeling that also lah. The episode in Jane's head where we meet all her sixty four personalities in the underground, right? Um, we all of them have great designs they by did. the way, character yeah. designs. It was so emotional and harrowing, and a, a very devastating depiction of what child abuse can do to a, a child's uh, psyche. Psyche, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, Unlike Legion, which is inventive but feels emotionless, would you say? Yeah. Uh, this show can be frightening and poignant when the time comes for it, lah. It has a lot of heart, though. Yeah, you know, whether it comes to Cliff's family tragedy, yeah. or Jane's sexual abuse as a child, or Larry's shame about his homosexuality, or the mystery surrounding Rita's regrets, yep. which ends up really being heartbreaking as well, or Sh- Cyborg's almost Shakespearean arc when yeah. he has to, you know, kill his dad. Yeah. Uh, it's all dealt with through a lot of visual poetry and fabulous acting and great heart. That's true. And Mr. Nobody is such a wonderfully OP villain <laughs> uh, who uses his omniscience to some amazing meta narration. Uh, his motivation even makes sense. It does. If, with his short backstory. And even now, Calder's backstory flashback greatly explains some of the horrible things he done. Yeah. Or he does. Or is revealed at the end to the yeah, other Doom Patrol members. Play, the great twist at the end felt so earned, juicy uh, and earned, right? Yeah, because I, I almost forgot... Now called this flashback story Yeah And I was like Oh yeah I understand why he did this yeah. And I, I, I get it And maybe I would have done the same as well Maybe Yeah I mean um, This show is, is great You can kind of understand the, the Deeply the, the selfishness And the selflessness That's intertwined in each character yeah. um, Hardy has seen all of it All of it Okay well, what do you think Of the first season of Doom Patrol Well I have no idea I can't wait for season 2 Yeah definitely That's for sure yeah. Right Because they ended Kind of on a uh, Not really a cliffhanger Because yeah, but it's just in a a space where ah oh yeah I want to see more. I want to see more, right? You yeah, because the the team actually finally got gelled together. Yeah, the they, end, they uh. finally decided you know they want to stay. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, I loved how they just took us on this weird fucking journey mm. for a good fifteen weeks, mm. and I was just impressed by how much like a lot of the things you said. You know, a lot of the emotion that was put into this, um, and the characters made me want to stay. Mm. You know, th- Rita. You know who is this? Might be a a bit of a snobbish kind of a, a bitchy lady, for example. Mm. You know, but then thirties movie stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know the 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 Rita Haywood kind of character. Yeah, Rita Farr. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But how you fall in love with all the subtleties in her character, mm. and how she's just trying to you know all this redeeming is all about redemption lah for all of them. Recognizing yeah. what they've done prior and yeah. owning it. And owning it yeah. and you know moving forward and mm. trying to you know do some good in the world. La. Rita's story in particular is 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 shocking it's especially one of the best. because yeah. uh, I mean she has a Me Too story but from a different point of from view. The, yeah, exactly. Because she wasn't a victim of that. She was actually complicit in yeah. a lot of it. Uh, just to regain her fame, yeah. Uh, which I think is is very brave for them to to make one of their main characters do. Yeah, it seems unforgivable, but you, in the end, you do. Yeah, you know. I know it. I, I mean, it was a different time and place also, like Correct, correct. I mean, same thing with Larry, how he misled or his his lover and his wife yeah. and his family. Uh, for years. I mean, Cliff. Everyone has a kind of a tragic backstory, like. Everyone, yeah. Uh, as off kilter as it is, it's it's quite tragic also, like. Every. I mean, Jane's uh, whole. Story arc was great Every single character Had so much time to shine mm. In 15 episodes A lot of episodes That's dedicated to their story Yeah their story Almost you know? in a lost Like way And I like that It's distinctive in that way Because every episode I remember Because it's about A particular person Character yeah Yeah, yeah. yeah You know And I, I thought I would not like Cyborg's portrayal He came off as an asshole In a right? trailer but in the end you like, also yeah, from the big league correct bro, yeah. I'm like I'm one of the JL guys now we yeah. should call the JL A you know yeah it's like, it's like the <laughs> he con- likes to name drop <laughs> it's like the condescending tone when Arrow uh, appears on Legends of Tomorrow it's like guys I'm, I'm, from, the, I'm from the A team right yeah guys you guys are the B team yeah, yeah so when Cyborg's first appearance you know he had that a bit of a, a pompousness mm. and even then in the end you fall in love with his character mm. and his story arc and his tragedies you know and yeah, all why he's as damaged as the rest yeah. of them yeah. and that's the thing about Doom Patrol it balances the zaniness and the crazy of what is happening in the screen mm. with all these feelings of wow this guy's actually really broken mm. every single one of them are just like broken toys that are put together and mm. trying their best to you know mm. to live and so much heart so much heart in this, this this series that I really cannot wait to see season 2 and I hope it doesn't drop off like Legion 
Yeah. You know, mm. I have. I, I would yeah. say that this shows more promise than Legion season one, just because of its investment in character. Yeah. Whereas Legion season <laughs> one, I was. Legion season one, I was just more wowed by the inventiveness of the structure, mm, mm, uh, mm. not so much of the writing of the people. Yeah. This one, I'm wowed by the writing of the people, yeah. and the structure is just like a nice flourish. I, uh, yeah, I get, yeah, I get that. Um, I think yeah, like I was saying, it doesn't sacrifice. Or Hardy was saying, it doesn't sacrifice character and emotion for uh, idiosyncrasies. Yeah. Like, you know, there is storytelling fundamentals in here, and mm-hmm. it tells the story very well. Yep. Um, I hope you know, Mister Nobody comes back. He has to come back. Beard Hunter has to come back. Beard Hunter is still around. And Danny he's, the Street he's has in, to come uh, back. He's in Danny, right? Yeah, they are both in Danny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Danny I mean, the Street is low key one of the best characters, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it's it's amazing that they made like an actual living street one of the best characters in the show. And how in two episodes are you fall in love with a character like Flex Mentalo? Yeah. How? Yeah. I mean, he's such a he's such a good guy, you know. Yeah, he is. In two episodes, I was like, oh my god, this guy is so great. I really, I actually hope that he kind of joins the team. Me too. Uh, they introduced a new full time Doom Patrol member towards the end. Uh, now uh. it's called his daughter, who uh, is actually yeah. you know part of the comics. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I they haven't cast her yet, so that's why you didn't. That's why you see the face. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Clever, so, right? Smart, smart. Yeah. Um, how would you rate uh, season one of Doom Patrol? Nine and uh, nine out of ten. I'm go- I even going a bit higher. I mean, okay. The only reason I'm not giving it a ten out of ten, right? No, I'm not giving it a ten either. Oh, okay. I'm giving it a nine point five out of ten. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The only reason is because it's on DC streaming service. I want it to be everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. That's about it. Indeed. Um, but it's near perfect. Eventually, all of the DC streaming shows will be on Netflix. Yeah. Uh, now that the season has ended on DC Universe, then be transferred. Right? Next month, you will be able to watch Doom Patrol on Netflix. Mm-hmm. So, uh, we definitely urge you to catch it, uh, because uh, Hadi rated it at nine, I rated it at nine point five. So, uh, definitely go and watch it. So you're saying if it was on Netflix, you have rated it higher. Yeah. What kind of weird criteria <laughs> is that? I know nothing, so? lah. It's, it's, I, I love the show so much, lah. Uh, speaking of seasons that ended, yeah. and that is also a weird DC show that is now fully on Netflix, all 14 episodes. Ooh. It's Legends of Tomorrow. Yeah, Legends. Um, speaking of the wild and weird and wonderful DC shows, Legends of Tomorrow is definitely one of them. In fact, the granddaddy of them all. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it just ended its delightful fourth season, and I, I. I once again, my god, I love this show. <laughs> uh, while the rest of CW's Arrowverse sort of suffocates under the weight of its own self-seriousness, yeah. Legends of Tomorrow flies with self-aware silliness and a dedication to fun over everything else. Yeah. Um, it's always playful and frequently bonkers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this season augments the usual time travel escapades mm. with magic yes. and monsters and demons. And, and unicorn. And, and, and John Constantine joining the show, you know. Like, you, I mean, you just mentioned the unicorn, right? Whether they're hunting a rampaging unicorn in Woodstock or fighting spirits with, like, Lucha Libre wrestlers in the <laughs> 60s or taking part in a Bollywood dance number. That um, was so cool! The Legends yeah. Adventures are very joyous. La. It is. Um, what do you guys think of Season 4 of Legends of Tomorrow? Does it live up to the previous seasons, which have all been amazing except for Season 1? It's my favourite season. Yeah. It's my favourite season. I think it's the best season so far. Yeah. I think the addition of Magic and Constantine in this, mm. uh, it, it does great justice not only to the existing law of the legends, right? Uh, and like just where they can kind of go from there yeah, and, and how they set up for next season actually, mm. uh, which is great. But uh, I sorely miss Constantine as a character and I've enjoyed every time that he showed up on Legends so far and to have him present for an entire season mm. adds a lot uh, more to our already stellar cast of misfits, mm. which I really, really love. And the adventures that they go on, right, are just out of this world. Yeah. You know, so like the, in, in, in its entirety, like there's nothing really, <laughs> I, you, I can't recommend this yeah. uh, more, more than we probably will. They also, weirdly enough, actually wrapped up uh, a long running arc from the Constantine show that was never wrapped up. Yes. Oh, the demon. Uh, and also who you know, Astra. Yeah, Astra, Astra, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 which is great, right? Yeah. Because like I, I, um, the is the Constantine animated one still going ongoing, or is that done already? Yes, but it's just a small little side story. It's like six minutes per episode or something. Right? Yeah, so it's a very short, like mini, like yeah. web web series. No, right? ninety seconds. Per Sorry, it's like ninety seconds. Yeah, per it's episode. a very short show. Yeah. 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 So I mean, like, just for them to be able to work that in yeah. into legends of all things yeah. was great. Like mm. I, I. It, it was the payoff that I would have expected to see after like five seasons of Constantine, mm. right? But to have it worked in this way and have the same kind of weight mm. while it being a legend show is 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 incredible. Yeah, um, Hadi, I was just impressed with ah uh, the zaniness. Okay, if Doom Patrol, it's a different kind of zany yeah. from Doom Patrol. Yeah. This was this was a very heartwarming show. 
Yeah. You know, and you you know the the the, the he- uh, spoiler alert. Yeah. The hatching of the dragon egg. Yeah. Uh, the the building of a theme park. You know, then the father's real intention. <laughs> he will. He will. Yeah. Which was. What a great like, <laughs> name for a theme park, right? Theme park. And also, you know, a pun on their last name. Yeah, their yeah. last name exactly. So, and, and then that relationship between um, Ray and his dad. Ray and his dad. You know, oh, I'm sorry, sorry um, Nate and his Nate dad. And his dad. Yeah. And uh, how Ray was involved in the, the you know yeah. sacrificing himself yeah. for Nate. Yeah. Um, uh, Nate slowly falling in love with um, um, Wingle Zari. <laughs> Zari, the yeah. Muslim. Um, she's Muslim, right? She's Muslim. Yeah. yeah. And how the reason she she was uh, yeah. Uh, oppressed in the future la. Yeah And how the Her story You know Became an integral part la, of, yeah. of the entire yeah. thing la. Yeah. I'm a bit sad about the, it, That ending though Yeah mm. Because yeah. yeah It was interesting though It was, it was interesting It was an yeah. interesting move um, I think The great part of the show Like I mentioned also Besides the weird Insane inventiveness Of it mm. right Is the relationship Between characters yeah. Like you were saying You know um, Ree and Nate's friendship also mm. Is actually quite sweet uh, you already talked about Nate and his dad, which I expected to be the dad specifically. I expected to be the big bad, you know. No, no. A- ended up being a really sweet turnaround yeah. for yeah. him as well. Um, Eva's relationship with Sarah Lance mm. uh, yeah. also very well serviced as well. So there's emotional development there, um, and even by the end, we felt for the literal monsters or the weak villains, you know, yeah. because you know they ended up being the actual victims of yeah. and, and the ones that they had to save, lah. Yeah. Because you know the the audience and the legends have come to realize that they're not necessarily bad because they have powers or they look scary. Yeah. I mean. The legends themselves were all Once half of them were, were villains, villains right? Yeah. <laughs> At one point of time, yeah. Uh, Sarah Lance was a merciless yeah. assassin, yeah. and I mean, not to talk about like Mick, who ended up being like a romance author, by the oh way. Oh my god, which was yeah. such a good story arc. Yeah. Mick's arc was, was so fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I loved it, and I loved that little scene, that scene where he goes on to talk about when like he came really out. In depth. Oh my god, yeah. it was so good. It was so good. There was a convention that he went to, a romance convention. Yeah, yeah and right. the shapeshifter, uh, uh, what's Charlie. Her name? Charlie was Charlie. taking the place of uh, yeah. Rebecca then, Silver. Yeah, but then Mona was there who was a great fan. Yeah, <laughs> so she's, Mona called she, her out. Mona is also now like a Hawaiian werewolf. Yeah, Uh-oh. which was bizarre. Another was great, she had a really good, I thought all the, 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 the legends adjacent. Mm. So like Mona and um, mm. Gary, Gary. And his evil and Nepo his that went to hell. <laughs> Like one of the like actual ending plots was about an uh, evil Nepo that Gary lost in Woodstock in the first episode. In the first episode, because he went to hell, so it turned evil yeah. and it possessed him. Yeah, it was. It was. It's brilliant. Uh, it's, 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 it's amazing, so, so But also a a good narrative on like bullying yes. and mm. of not being appreciated by your betters and all that stuff. Yeah. Not like you know, and Gary's storyline was as much as it was crazy and zany and you know all that stuff. It was also really sad and. A lot of heart also, you know. Yeah. yeah. Also, how how scary he took out the the pent up feelings of resentment. Yeah. How scary he was, you know. He essentially made a bunch of women do things against their will, which yep. is very scary. Very yeah. scary. But it was done in a fun way, yep. so as not to drive it home too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because that wasn't the point. That wasn't the point. Yeah. 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 Because we wanted uh, Gary was still essentially a good guy, like a good nature person. Good nature person, yeah. Like. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, what's the fairy godmother's the new Tabitha. fairy Tabitha? But the new one, um. Oh. Right. What's her name? Um, uh, Nora Duck. Nora Duck. Yes. Yeah. I keep forgetting their names. Yeah. It's fine. But yeah, Nora Duck and her storyline also. Oh. Everybody no. had like well fleshed storylines, and yeah. there's so many characters. Yeah. Mm. I thought Nora's uh, redemption arc was actually very well done. Yeah. Right. For something that initially for the previous season I thought was a throwaway. Mm. You know, uh, just like this whole idea. I'm glad they revisited it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the fairy godmother thing was just bizarre. Because she's mm. now a fairy godmother lah. Which is so, yeah. so strange. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite episode is actually the mid season finale, Legends to Meow Meow, uh, <laughs> which um. <laughs> Which finds themselves in themselves in various alternate timelines, and they get to parody a bunch of seventies and sixties shows like mm-hmm. Charlie's Angels yeah. and the A Team. And each time they change the timeline, yeah. the altered team gets new opening credits, yeah, and it gets worse awesome. and worse. You know, yeah. like the the uh, Sirens of Space Time, which was the Charlie's Angels one. Uh, and yeah, they turn to cats. They turn yeah. to felt puppets. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the show is is really insane, uh, and and I applaud them for doing all these things that. Things like Arrow and Flash would can cannot do cannot do. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Flash once upon a time would be able to. Yeah, yeah, but, but it's lost its sense of fun. Really, yeah. it has. Uh. And Supergirl is so uh, Supergirl is good. Don't get me wrong, uh, but it's so it's entrenched. In, it's so entrenched in politics right now. Yeah, it's hard for it to have fun. Yeah, yeah. it's because it's dealing with a very Trumpian world. So now it needs to be serious. Mm. You know? Yeah. 
Um, as you all know, uh, all the Arrowverse shows will be culminating with Crisis on Infinite Earths coming this December. Can't wait. Uh, the monitor who we last saw on Elseworlds actually appeared on all the finales for all the Arrowverse yeah, shows. He was using mm. popcorn. Yeah, so he was playing a very big part in all the other finales. For, exa- for example, on Supergirl, he was you know collaborating with Lex Luthor. Mm-hmm. On Arrow, you know, I think there's an implication that Arrow is the one that's going to die in Crisis on Infinite Earths, which of course leads to his final season. Yeah, because his contract ends. Uh, things like <laughs> that. La. So so he played a very big deal in in adjusting the fate of those worlds. Mm-hmm. But like it says a lot when he comes to Legends, right? <laughs> he he just anything. enjoys. <laughs> he just eats popcorn. He comes just... to Legends and then you know he wants to like affect the outcome, but he's just so like wowed by. The insanity that's happening It's like There's no yeah. way I can make this yeah, better Because back. when he was there There was a dragon flying There was yeah. a witch There was a yeah. There was a demon Then yeah. he conjures popcorn The <laughs> monitor is like This is the best timeline <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna sit back And enjoy this I don't need to alter anything yeah, I'm good <laughs> uh, This is amazing um, I'm rating this An 8 out of 10 8 Eight, yeah. yeah, solidly, easily, easily. Yeah. yes. Yeah, eight out of ten. I mean, I still prefer to do Pantro a bit more. Yeah, because of how much more you feel. Yeah, yeah. But both really, really highly rated. Please go and watch this shit. Yeah, the the two DC right DC has always killed it on TV. To be honest, yeah. mm. you know. Um, I I still would say the best superhero show of all time is still Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. but yeah, Legends yeah. and Doom Patrol are slowly creeping out there oh, yeah. the only reason I say Legend, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is still the best superhero show is because they've delivered I think four consistently great seasons yeah. Yeah. and this season seems to be quite good so yes yeah. I've enjoyed it so far yeah. we and will be covering that indeed once the season wraps up uh, Legends because of its consistency over the last two three seasons is getting there getting yeah. there uh, Doom Patrol like you said I'm worried that it might be like Legion and have bad season 2 but let's hope not yeah so consistency is key for me to call you the greatest yeah, yeah of yeah. course definitely string together a few a fun, bunch of great seasons then you're great yeah mm, up there already sure. power yeah. rankings number one mm. yeah <laughs> power rankings number one um, I think after the weight and the heaviness of Game of Thrones I really enjoy Things like Doom Patrol and Legends. Legends. Mm. And speaking of weird things like that, like yeah. we're gonna be talking about um, Taika Watiti and Jermaine Clement's vampire mockumentary movie, <laughs> which has made a seamless transition into television. And of course, we're talking about what we do in the shadows, lah. His his 2014 vampire mockumentary set in New Zealand, now set in New York. Um, one of the things I love about what we do in the shadows is it's very uniquely offbeat and yeah. it kind of has a very charmingly deadpan humor. Yep. And I think it's translated well into a longer format. Um, it brilliantly expands the quirky mythology that uh, YTT has laid out mm-hmm. in the movie. You know, uh, look out for the introduction of energy vampires, which is <laughs> hilarious. And I think you all, if you once you watch um, Cl- uh, Colin Robinson, Colin, yes, once you Colin. Wa- once you watch Colin Robinson in the show, right, you've met people like that in your office, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. From the first episode, actually, right? Like, you immediately can identify yeah, the yeah. characters. There are that. people like that I know in my life. Uh-huh. Uh, but the show kind of finds uh, a delightful balance between that goofy tone and also the macabre and the mundane uh, with a new cast that I think quickly establishes a great comedic chemistry. I actually really like this cast. Um, the new vampires, once you get to know their quirks, are actually oh. really hilarious. Yeah. Uh, Laszlo is actually my favourite in particular because his oh. sex history is just ridiculous. Yeah, Matt Berry he, is amazing. His like, topiary-shaped like vaginas, that means a lot to him. You know, yes. He has a garden just full of topiary-shaped like vaginas. And one of them <laughs> is his mother's, <laughs> yeah. you know, which I, I, I guess makes sense because it does mean a lot to him. Uh, and then when you find out about his porn career, since the, <laughs> since the late 1800s, since... Film was invented Which leads to A wonderful montage Of all the porn films He's been in Best porn parody (laughs) Including one from the 1990s That parody Seinfeld Called Seinfuck Uh, Hey What's the deal With all the pages (laughs) Oh my god I mean the the rest are great too Like Nadia is great Uh, Nando is hilarious too And so is your Hapless human familiar uh, Guillermo Who I feel Actually is actually The most sympathetic character In the show Well he's He's kind of out in Right into this Very very strange world Mm -hmm. Right He's the He's kind of The human anchor to the whole thing I do like the Whenever they portray These moments where You can tell That he's get He's running out of patience Yeah Right uh, So some context right Guillermo is um, A familiar He's a familiar yeah, yeah so with the understanding That if you serve a vampire Long enough Eventually you get Turned into a vampire like Yeah He has been serving uh, What's his name Nando Nando For a decade plus Yes And, and he, he's nowhere near Getting a promotion nope, Shall we say Not at all uh, And his frustration Becomes very palpable As the season goes along As he sees like Fucking nobodies That they turn into vampires yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like on a whim This is jealousy of them Yeah It's, it's, it's really It's really Um interesting right like for him to be kind of our inroads into this whole like secret elite society mm. and f- to feel his frustration as well right with this whole idea of you know a traditionally 
high fantasy vampires, right? Mm. And that whole, whole and subverting all of that is mm. great. Yeah, I mean, it it does have a very realistic look at how old school high fantasy vampires would function in modern society. It does, yeah. and how fucking lame they will be. Yes, <laughs> as, as, especially when they encounter vampires who have adapted really well. Like when they went to the, the Manhattan, ne- right. the, yeah, the Manhattan vampires who appear to have adapted really well. Then when they went to went to the nightclub with the capes, <laughs> and then they look. <laughs> and then they're wondering why everybody else is wearing black latex. <laughs> just, oh my god. Uh, my favorite episode is actually The Trial Which features the show's uh, Vampire standing trial For the murder of a vampire overlord Named the Baron mm. uh, They are summoned in front of The, the Vampire Council Which is entirely made out of actors Who have played vampires In previous movies <laughs> or TV shows <laughs> just, just to keep count They have uh, a vampire named Tilda Played by Tilda Swinton mm-hmm. Who is obviously a vampire uh-huh. And only lovers left alive yep. They have a vampire named Danny called, uh, Played by Danny Trejo yep. From Dust to Dawn yep. Uh, they have a vampire named Paul, uh, aka Paul Rubens from the ba- Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie. They have Eve- Evan Rachel Wood, a vamp- playing a vampire called Evan from True Blood, yeah. as you would know. Uh, they even have a vampire named Wesley, uh, aka Wesley Snipes. Uh, uh, he actually plays a half vampire daywalker, <laughs> and he appears via Skype because he couldn't make it. <laughs> and of course, uh, Clement Waititi and uh, Johnny Bro, who were the original vampires from the What We Do in the Shadows movie, mm-hmm. also pop up yeah. as the part of the Vampire Council. And and that was a nice cameo as well. Yeah. And that episode itself, right, even had other cameos that were not part of the Vampire Council, like uh, Dave Batista was in it. <laughs> as uh, he plays one of the vampire prisoners, yeah. you know, who who was uh, falsely accused of raising a vampire baby. It's a it's a long story, la. But essentially, <laughs> one one of our three vampires that we get to know, uh, on a whim, decided to turn uh, an infant into a vampire, which mm. is a big no no in the vampire community. Yeah. And then he panicked, and he just left it in the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> It's you know, I, I mean, like the about, vampire yeah. now is like eighty years old, you know, yeah. <laughs> but he's still like a baby. He cannot talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and they also like mention all the other absent members that couldn't make it to the meeting, including like Kiefer yeah. Sutherland, uh, Tom and Brad yeah. from Interview yeah. the Vampire, yeah. Rob. Which it took me a while to figure out it was Rob Pattinson from Twilight. Oh yeah. my god. Oh, I didn't catch that. Oh shit. Okay. It was like Rob. Which is the famous Rob? And then, like, the next day, Rob Pattinson was cast as Batman. I was like, oh, oh my god, uh, is that Rob? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, um, what do you think of, like, the season as a whole, I guess? Oh man, it is it is insane how naturally this feel how natural this feels as a as a series. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, I mean, even the original movie kind of had a very episodic. Mm. Uh, feel to it but the extra amount of time that you have uh, really really helps the show tonally right with the mundane mm. with the banality of everyday life and it, that these vampires find themselves in um, I think it's very well paced even mm. though it's deadpan yeah right uh, and even though some scenes like are intentionally slow and drawn mm. out and painful for comedic value yeah. uh, especially every scene involving Colin <laughs> Colin yeah <laughs> but I mean it's it's funny because it's so not funny yeah. right? my favourite episode is yeah. actually the one where Colin has to battle uh, the, the other nuclear. energy the, the other energy vampire in yes, office yes. yeah oh my god I then they try to outboard each other it was fucking hilarious yeah. oh, it's I mean it's so boring but it's funny <laughs> it's so yeah and like you watch this train wreck that's happening right yeah. like, oh my god I actually yeah. know situations like that I've, <laughs> I've seen situations just like this. So um, to be clear The other energy vampire Doesn't draw energy from boredom She draws energy from um, Depression or emotion Sympathy Sympathy yes, Yeah So, so she always story, She yeah. a sorry person She always says like, Oh my dog get, got run over today My uncle just died That type of thing yeah. You always know someone Who was all, like that You've met people like that Who always <laughs> Want sympathy And tell you some sob story And this is like Their eighth grandfather That has died over the last year You know that kind of thing <laughs> So yeah, I mean that was a really good episode and yeah. a good feature on Colin, who is not kind of part of the main crew. Yeah, but he's yeah. a nice side character. Yeah, you know, I, he's like Toby in the office. You know, yeah, 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 for sure. I I mean like just every time he pops out, it it it, it kind of grounds mm. right the entire series. So yeah. like on the one hand you have Guillermo who's trying to get into the vampire, but on the other hand you have Colin, totally normal. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, like his introduction in the pilot episode yeah. was great. It's great. Yeah, we are the most common type of vampire. Yeah. I love it. It's so good. It's so they good. are surprisingly common. <laughs> yes, I've seen more of them than I've seen actual <laughs> vampires. Um, so I think overall I'll rate this a seven point five out of ten, only because it takes a uh, a couple of episodes for it to really find its groove. That is true. I yeah. think towards the end, like its last half. Mm. Were, were excellent yeah, you know, Like consistently yeah. But the first four episodes A bit hit and miss Some of the jokes mm. So that's why I wouldn't give it Like uh, a super overwhelming Recommend But 7.5 is a very Strong recommendation yep. Also yeah. uh, I'm gonna give it a 7 mm. I, I think I have the same Concerns as you are It took me Like 
a good three episodes mm. uh, to kind of like get into that headspace, right? Where yeah. like that completely works. Uh, I love the cast. Yeah, uh, I, I love the acting that they're doing. Um, I I love the jokes that they're writing, but it took a while to latch mm. for me. And um, overall, uh, I I really recommend it, especially if you enjoyed the movie. Mm-hmm. If you enjoyed what they did with um, what's the other cop one that we reviewed? Um. Uh, yeah, yeah, the New Zealand one. New Zealand. I, 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 it doesn't. I, f- I forgot the title of the top of my head, but yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if you like that, if you like Taika Waititi and Style, what he has yeah. done, um, this series does not suffer from his absence, even though he hasn't had as big a role to play with the movie or mm. or with the. Other he directed series. one episode and guest starred in one. That's yeah. his extent. Yeah, yeah, but like it is a completely, um, it's a great successor to all mm. of that. Yeah, so it's a seven for me. Yeah, um, I think it's more of a Jermaine Clement uh, from what, Flight of the Concords. He mm. he's the one kind of running this ship. Mm. Um, yeah, so I mean, good recommend seven out of ten, yes, seven point five out of ten. Uh, next up, we'll be talking about um the first ever live action Pokemon movie starring Ryan Reynolds. It is Detective Pikachu. So um. As I mentioned, this is the story involving the titular Pokemon teaming up with the son of his detective partner, played by Justice Smith. Uh, and together, they investigate the mystery of the said detective's disappearance, as well as unravel a huge conspiracy. Um, as, it ti- as its title implies, this is a neo-noir PI story, yep. um, set inside a Blade Runner-esque city where humans and Pokemon live side by side and work together. Um, the result feels like kind of a modern day version of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. In a way. Uh, that relies on kind of nostalgia. Uh, Ryan, no- Ryan Reynolds' trademark comedic banter. And the chemistry between Justice Smith and Reynolds, uh, mm. who obviously voices the adorable Pikachu. Yeah. Um, I think it's a triumph of world building and beautiful effects because all the Pokemon on screen are so f- freaking realistic, photorealistic. Um, as a mystery, it succeeds because... Um, it has some genuinely shocking twists and revelations. Um, towards the end, the twist ending legit made me gasp. Like, I did not see it coming. I guffawed. Um, that being said, it is a little too by the numbers in its narrative formula, and there's nothing inspired about the movie beyond its fan service touches. Yep. Um, it's a passable family movie for me, and a treat for Pokemon fans specifically. Uh, and by default, I guess the best video game movie ever made. By default, yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you. F- Hadi will replace Isa as my. Yeah. As my venturing partner here Because Hardy has seen it Like the Pikachu yeah. uh, What do you think of it? Uh, okay this was fun Ryan Reynolds voice acting Was great mm. Justin Smith You know Being this um, How his character Slowly became More self-assured More confident on himself As he discovered His whole um, Backstory of his father You know And all that mm-hmm. That was great You know And him You know I, 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 I enjoyed this movie Overall Yeah uh, I Had to watch it With my Two little cousins mm. So that that I, And you could see That they were really Enjoying themselves Throughout uh. mm. And so yeah You're right When it, it's a family Kind of like You should bring the kids kind Bring the kids Bring Pokemon fans Especially yeah. yeah And as a Pokemon fan Yeah big, Then this is kind of Like a A, a, a kind of sequel To the <laughs> first movie Yeah Because that's the same U2 that they, they caught that, uh, that Correct that, that showed I up think it's actually movie. Officially considered The sequel to Oh that. shit Yeah Okay Yeah, yeah At least it exists In that universe like. Yeah exactly yeah. So Ash Ketchum Is somewhere <laughs> Somewhere around Yeah yeah. So I think he showed up In the commercial right I think so yeah Yeah, yeah but not in the movie But never mind yeah. la. Uh, Yes you're right The twist at the end Was like oh okay Yeah That's quite cool Because it It um it's not nonsense why Brian Reynolds is voicing Pikachu. Yeah. And and they made that a very um pivotal plot point in the movie. I like how they tried to like um try to like get us out of that like, uh they tried to explain it early in the movie mm. where it was a guess that he breathed in therefore, yeah. you know, he yeah. But then there was a red herring and it then you find out herring, the real yeah. ending towards the end. Um that that was pretty good lah. Um, I think it is nothing too special nothing, though. No. Uh, Pokemon fans would get a definite treat out of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. As just a movie on its own, it's just okay. Yeah, seven, six and a half. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll rate it a six. Yeah, six, six and a half. It's a decent movie to go and just have fun with. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not a bad movie, definitely. No, not a bad movie. Yeah, it was well made. It Way better than it should have been, to be honest. Exactly. Given yeah. the ridiculousness of the premise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no spoilers lah. No spoilers, uh, but but I mean, like, given how many other ridiculous things that we've given good reviews to, yeah. ridiculousness shouldn't be shouldn't a downside, be a thing, yeah. If you it's executed well, correct. It's just not ex- executed as well as Legends or yeah. the Patrol. Yeah. 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 Uh, but overall, it is very very true to the the Pokemon uh, like anime, mm. uh, and how 
You mentioned the theme song, you know? Yeah. Ryan Reynolds was singing it. Yeah, he was. You know? And then my, my audience actually started singing along. It yeah. was pretty cool. Uh. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, that, that kind of feel. Uh. And, and again, a feel good movie. Uh, go and have fun with it. I mean, it's no longer showing, I think. It is true. Oh, it's still showing? Yeah. But it should be the last few runs already, right? Well, it's only been three weeks. Three weeks, right? So oh, I, I, it's usually about two months like, for some movies. Okay. Yeah. Well, can go and. Especially for kids' it. movies like this, it will actually last longer. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I would recommend though to 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 actually watch it if you're a Pokemon fan. If you have kids, mm-hmm. go and bring them to this. I mean, it is the best video game movie ever made, la. Which is not a very high bar, la. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, the last one we gave was another like five point five or six movie, like Tomb Raider. Yeah. So hopefully one of these days we'll get a seven out of ten movie from one of these. Soon, soon, soon. Mortal Kombat coming out in twenty twenty one. Hopefully. Oh ah, yeah. I mean, just get the John Wick guys or the Raid guys. Okay, get some great action, you know. Yeah, 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 don't don't work. don't do story. Just have them fight to the death. Ah, uh, you don't want the Mortal Kombat story. The Mortal Kombat story is so convoluted. Of course, yeah. of course. Um, next up, we'll be delving into a little segment I like to call Quick Hits, which is where I talk about the various movies, TV shows, and other things that uh, my co-host here may not have seen or didn't have time to watch. Although some of them did manage to catch a couple of the things on the list uh, this month, so they might chime in. Uh, first, I want to talk about a movie that you should not bring your kids to. Do not, because they'll be scarred for life. It is a James Gunn produced horror movie that is a slight alternate universe take on a classic Superman origin story. Of course, I'm talking about Brightburn. In this film, an alien baby crashes on Earth and is adopted by a wholesome all American family living on a Kansas farm. While the scenario clearly parallels the Kent's family, this kid doesn't share Clark's values or morality one bit. In fact, it's entirely more believable that a boy struggling with his identity on the onset of puberty and the discovery of his immense powers would begin lashing out this way. Um, The result is really, really gruesome. Like, I mean, as a jump scare, it doesn't... It is, isn't as effective as like, Conjuring or anything, but in terms of just like Saw-esque brutality, right? It is really fucking terrifying and disturbing as this petulant, unstoppable god begins to terrorize the residents of a small town. Um, this takes Zack Snyder's Man of Steel interpretation and takes it to its logical conclusion. Um, there are so many creepy kids in horror, right? I mean, I guess you would agree with me if you've seen things like Pet Cemetery lately or... Uh, or Omen Or a ton of other creepy kids right But trust me There is no creepy kid As terrifying as someone With Superman's power It will It's just not possible Try you, I mean Some of these kids They turn their heads They float a bit You know They talk in another voice But imagine a kid With Superman's power That is evil It's It's unimaginably terrifying I mean He's faster Stronger Can rip you in half He can, can rip the world in half In the blink of an eye <coughs> Got the whole laser eye thing. Yeah. <coughs> so um, this is a nice little Else Worlds short story, even though they don't have the, the DC right, treatment. Yeah. yeah. Um, that being said, even in cinema, I would point to something like Chronicle that takes uh, or deals with themes with superpowers in a much more nuanced and organic okay. fashion and a less uh, cookie cutter fashion than this. Yeah. Because this isn't as original as it would like to seem. Ah, okay. Perhaps it's original for cinema, but I would I think I've seen Chronicle do it a bit better because okay. the villain in Chronicle had kind of the same I was bullied, that type of thing, why w- I, then he lashes out. So I think it, with Chronicle it made me feel sympathy for the villain first. And then that's ma- what makes his turn more tragic. Mm. This kid, like, I really don't know what set him off other than puberty, and he's a child. La. And I've seen kids, like, just go off for no reason, so I, I kind of believe it. La. Very tantrum esque. Yeah, like 11, 12 year olds. So I, I, I get it. La. But, you know, at least with the kid in Chronicle, I understood more. You had the backstory more. Correct, yeah. Okay. And I have seen other Elseworlds stories done like this in comics, so it's not as original. As it would like to appeal uh, from the marketing. Okay. Uh, so this one goes from idyllic to slash it in no time. Mm. Uh, that's why I think it's a bit rushed as a story. Uh, and it makes his heel turn not as compelling as it mm. could be. La. Uh, so all in all, I liked it. 7 out of 10. Okay. Definite recommend. I mean, it's more of a horror movie than a... Straight up horror movie. A straight up horror movie. La. Yeah, with okay. very little story. <laughs> okay, okay. The, the story is the premise. Okay. And uh, if you watch the trailer, it delivers what it promises and nothing more. Okay. Nothing less. Yeah. So seven uh, is a recommend. Seven, yeah. yeah. Uh next up I would like to talk about the Twilight Zone. The rebooted Twilight Zone. Hot of the success of Get Out and Us, uh comedian Jordan Peele continues his transition into sci-fi and fantasy mm-hmm. with the revival of a classic anthology, The Twilight Zone. This new twenty nineteen version lives up to Rod Serling's nineteen fifties vision by using creepy genre conceits as parables for social critique mm-hmm. and um political commentary. 
uh, it is very uneven though. Okay. Um, but at its peak, its stories are very urgent and challenging and smartly contemporary. Uh, and yet it still feels timeless enough that if you were to watch like 50 years from now, they would still be considered cl- all-time classics, you know, because there were some episodes from the 1950s that yeah. still feel relevant today. Yeah. And I think some of them are as timeless as those. Lah. Um, at, it, at its worst, uh, some episodes can feature themes that are too derivative mm-hmm. or most glaringly too on the nose. Mm. It really hammers you over the head with a particular allegory. Like, yes, I get it. Like in the first five minutes, I don't need to spend like 58 minutes watching this. So that is a bit of a downside. La. And on the balance, they are more of the worst than they are of the best. Okay. Yeah, right. So it's inventive, it's incisive, it's less c- cynical than Black Mirror. The Twilight Zone is a thoughtful feat, but it's not always that. Okay. Uh, which, to be honest, it actually th- it's actually mirrors the original Twilight Zone quite well. Because the episodes, remember, are great, but a lot of them went. And yeah, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Um, my favorite episode, the one that you should definitely check out, is called Replay. Mm-hmm. Um, it stars uh an African American mother and son uh as they endure a Groundhog style nightmare, oh, no. Groundhog Day style nightmare. I'm sorry, where they are pursued by a racist police officer. Um, thankfully, the mother's vintage re- re- camcorder is able to rewind them back to the time before the trouble started. So, um, but no matter how many times they loop back to the original points, they yeah. somehow always find themselves in the crosshairs of a racist cop. Um, its depiction of the many ways black civilians can unwittingly run afoul of white cops is disturbing in its truth. Uh, but it's also layered by showing how law enforcement mis- misconduct that's gone on for generations can now be e- more easily exposed because everyone has a camera. Yeah. Uh, but no matter how many times it's exposed, no matter all the different ways black people try to avoid trouble, the cycle continues again and again. Uh, unfortunately, not all episodes are of this quality, so it's just a five out of ten for me. Whoa, it's, it's a bare recommendation. That it's must have really a lot of shitty. Episodes. It had a lot of shitty episodes, to be honest. To be honest, wow. there were two good episodes and one great episode, and seven really bad episodes. Ah, okay. Yeah, of its ten episodes, that is really uneven. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, I mean, at, at at its height, it's quite genius. Like, at its worst, it's really bad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and now I'm going to be talking about the second season. Of uh, Cloak and Dagger Which mm. myself and Hardy Actually reviewed a few ep- For well, season in, one In one of our first episodes yeah. Actually of Journal Equality When we had worse audio Yeah um, Now in the second season Cloak and Dagger Has far and away Overtaken Runaways As the MCU's Most compelling TV drama Not on networks la. Okay Yeah uh, Last season The show excelled When dealing with Smaller s- Street level stories Involving yeah. police brutality Gang violence mm. Homelessness Drug addiction but where the show really si- shines is the amazing chemistry between Tandy, played by Olivia Holt, and uh, Tyrone, played by Aubrey Joseph. And that's the most important thing. Correct. For a show called Cloak and Dagger. Cloak and Dagger has to work. Yeah. And their, their on-screen chemistry really sizzles. Uh, they crackle whenever they are together. Uh, they feel like they're fa- they feel like they're fated to be t- to- together. Okay. Which, I mean, should be. La. Should be, yeah. Uh, so it, this is great casting on that part. Um, where it falters later in the first season, right? If you remember, yes. the stakes got too high. Yes. It became just another superhero it show did. where they have to fight superpowered zombies and the glowing thing in the sky, yep. you know. This second season. It went tropey, lah. It went tropey. This second season smartly understands what fans loved about the first season and yeah. leans into it. Tandy and Tyrone spend more time together from the beginning, whereas in the first season, Large, uh, large chunks of it Will spend apart Yeah they're fighting each other Correct And yeah. their interactions Carry the show They're now like Really friends la, On a personal level Okay uh, But You know I like the granular detail Over their personal struggles So mm. Tandy is still dealing With the after effects Of domestic abuse Which shouldn't be Just gone after the first season And yeah. epiphany right Yeah Or Tyrone is deli- de- still dealing With the consequences Of what racist cops Have done to him Yeah uh, it hits hard because it feels real. Um, aside from that, the season stories really hinge upon social issues like forgotten minority communities yeah. or really harrowing crimes like human trafficking. Um, unlike Marvel's Netflix shows where issues like this only kind of make up the backdrop, yeah. like Luke Cage, yeah. uh, in Clone and Dagger, these are fundamentally the stories of these people on the ground level struggling to cope with situations like this. Uh, this is their lives and just not, not gritty window dressing. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Plus, the city of New Orleans is such a great setting, and the show really uses jazz and voodoo uh, as compelling thematic symbolism. For example, the villain is actually a jazz musician mm-hmm. with um, chronic splitting migraines, and the only way he can relieve those migraines is by phys- psychically feeding on other people's misery and suffering. So he's actually the head of a sex and human trafficking ring that abducts uh, drug addicted or otherwise forgotten by society type of runaway girls. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Uh, and then sells them as sex slaves And then therefore feeds on their misery uh, Feeds on them that way Like It's actually 
one of the more horrific or evil things I've seen a villain do on a show yeah. or on any Marvel show to be honest it it really is horrifying la. and quite clever quite clever yeah um, Tandy and Tyrone who have we've seen in season 1 can view people's hopes and fears respectively when they touch them right so Tandy can view someone's hopes Tyrone can view someone's oh, fears yes, yeah. right so one of the great visual representations of the girls trauma is when they are trying to find the identity of these girls seductors and mm-hmm. you know they find one of the girls they touch they touch her I mean not in that way like yeah, yeah, touch no, her to yeah. find their hopes and fears yeah. and what they see inside her is nothing it's just empty blackness she has no fears she has no hopes she has no feeling yeah she has, she's just been used up yeah, which yeah. is kind of great stark visual representati- representation of what girls like this must actually feel yeah No, it's not anger It's not fear It's, it's nothingness. just nothingness uh, You just feel used you know? Ooh, yeah. That's deep Correct uh, And of course The the villain right um, How he uses his abilities Is actually related to vo- Voodoo law It's, it's pretty cool uh, What's even cooler Is the psychic space Where he keeps a catalogue Of the people's pains um, It's actually a giant Jazz record store uh, Where all the victims Are categorized by name and dates You know Like for example New releases and so forth Uh, the photography and the album artwork on each vinyl cover represents each person's painful memory, and it, it, there's a lot of thought and uh, and and beauty lah put into the drawings and the photography that makes up uh, the the vinyl artwork. So even like small details like that, I really really like. What network is this on again? It's on Freeform. Freeform, right? Yeah, it's yeah. part of the. It's part of Disney. A- a- ABC owns it lah. Oh, ABC, uh, which is part of Disney. Which la. is part of Disney, yeah, correct? Yeah. Um, I like that Tandy and Tyrone's situations are reversed now. Mm-hmm. Tandy is back home living for mom, and their relationship is strengthened by attending domestic abuse and counseling. Uh, domestic abuse counseling, I'm sorry. Uh, whereas um, prep school, Tyrone is now the runaway fugitive, living in an abandoned church, cut off, cut off from his family and support system. So their roles are reversed in the season. Uh, both are now trying to fight crime their own way, and I love how they're well intentioned crime fighting. Forces them to come to terms with how crime punishment and suffering is less black and white and more complicated than they realize. Okay. For example, in the first episode, Tandy intimidates and threatens a man who is beating his girlfriend. Yeah. Simple, right? Yeah. But because the boyfriend was attacked, the girl mm. goes back to care for him. You know. Um, oh. It's unintended consequ- unintended consequences, lah. Same thing for Tyrone, who uses his teleportation teleportation powers to take money and drugs away from stash houses from the city's local gangs. Yeah. But because of that. He unintentionally starts a drug war between the various gangs who think they're stealing from each other. Supply, uh, Correct, uh, yeah. Uh, fucked up now. Exactly. So they don't understand the ecosystem. Yeah. Or, or, and they're too young to understand the mm. nuances of what what this is, lah. So I I like things like that, lah. They need daredevil. Correct. Correct. Yeah. To educate uh, them. Yeah. Uh, and not the Punisher, who is very yeah. black and white <laughs> like they <laughs> are. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Although I mean Considering thematically One is black One is white I you know, know. Uh, it, it makes sense, sense like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Additionally if you, Do you remember The cop friend From uh, season 1 yes. Bridget O'Reilly yes, um, yes. She transforms Into an anti-hero here Because she was affected By the the blast At the end of the season yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. she transformed Into the anti-hero Called Mayhem Oh okay uh, it's, it's In the comics It's a split personality Yes correct In the show She is literally duplicated So there is one good one And one bad And oh, okay Yeah yeah. I, I think she's really Really fantastic Her bad version Is very compelling It's, I wouldn't say compelling la. She's just fun to watch la. Okay okay Yeah, She's just Very Punisher-esque And really will get along With Frank Castle um, This show is Much improved More compelling More thoughtful The storytelling uh, And weirdly enough Although I know They wrote this before The Marvel Netflix thing happened yeah. It references a lot Of Marvel Netflix Oh yeah, I mean there was w- one particular episode, the finale, la, where yeah. one of the young drug dealers that Tyrone has been friends with or is trying to counsel out of the game uh, is basically inspired to get his life straight because you know he's reading about Luke Cage in the newspaper, you know that kind of thing, you know. Uh, that's nice. That's nice. Some tie-in, la. Um Sure, there are some contrived bumps along the way, and yeah, towards the end, it does suffer from the same problem as oh season no. one. You know, it always falls there. Why? But it's more good than bad. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. More good than bad. Okay, okay. This is a seven out of ten season. Another strong. Another strong one. The first one is seven out of ten as well. Yeah. But I think this one the highest hit higher. Oh, okay, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Um. Next up, I'm going to be talking about the second season of a Wolverine podcast. Oh yeah. Yeah. If you remember a few episodes, not a few lah, a long time a long ago, time ago exactly ago. one year ago, yeah. I I talked about a Wolverine podcast called The Lost Trail. Uh, this Wolverine podcast is one of the most immersive and engaging audio dramas I've ever heard. If you yeah. listen back to my review of season one, uh, you get all the reasons. I yeah. don't think I want to repeat that. But Wolverine: The Long Night is just as good. 
Um, I was I'm extremely high on this particular podcast. Um, yeah. It has exquisitely crafted sound design, amazing dialogue, top notch voice acting. It's pro- probably the finest made radio play I've heard in my life. Granted, I didn't grow up in an era where radio plays are prevalent, uh, so this comes from a modern lens. Um, nevertheless, I adore I adore this podcast. Um, season one was kind of a Twin Peaks esque murder mystery yeah. in the v- in the vast and frigid Alaskan wilderness. It has you know a, a bizarre nocturnal cult, a wealthy crime family, corrupt cops, that type of thing. Season two is a whole new ball game uh, because we moved to New Orleans now, mm. or, or the or the swamps and bayous of uh, Louisiana. Uh, so this is this is a great change of pace. Uh, season one, Wolverine wasn't the main character at all. Mm. He was a background character mm. that people talked about. In season two, he is the main you know, point of view character. So they immediately differentiate it, lah. Who plays Wolverine? Um, Richard Armitage. Ooh, yeah, that's a good voice. Good voice, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I like that Wolverine isn't someone being talked about. He's the main guy now, okay. So I mean, a bit of spoilers here. Season one ended with the revelation that the FBI agents hunting him mm-hmm. were actually humanoid robots, sentinels working for Weapon X. So after the solve after solving the murder in Alaska, Wolverine is on the run. He returns to Bangkok and then Tokyo before heading to Louisiana to catch, uh, or at least to search for a missing ex girlfriend named named Maureen, who he believes may have been taken by Weapon X. Okay, but in truth, Weapon X has nothing to do with it. Oh, yeah, it's an odyssey that goes from crowded New Orleans to kind of gated, infested Bayou swamps. Its storytelling is very good. You can practically feel the humidity on your brow wow. and like the bourbon on your lips, that type of thing. His investigation is complicated by other mutants, like, and this makes sense because Gambit pops up. Oh, of course, New you know, Orleans, New Orleans, yeah. right? And uh, Jason Wingard is actually the main villain of the season, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. mastermind. Uh, and also, weirdly enough, not weird because it's thematically resonant to current politics. The rise of um, anti-mutant hate groups in Trump's America, which oh, okay. would make sense yeah. if Trump was the president in that world. Well, why wouldn't there be anti-mutant yeah, hate yeah, groups? Like even more fervently than there was before. You come uh, out the woodwork and all. Of course, yeah. Um, specifically, he comes into contact with an anti-mutant biker gang, which becomes a big problem later oh, on. Okay. Uh, so those are some of the difficulties he's he's faced with. So here's the thing: like comics are an inherently visual medium, right? Yeah. Meant to be read and seen. Yeah. So on-screen adaptations of TVs and movies feel Makes like sense. more natural translations yeah. of the source material. But this old-school radio play paints a better picture and more compelling stories than a lot of Fox's movies. I mean, besides Logan, lah. Yeah. But like, it does a better job than that. They they record with something called a three D mic, uh-huh. which is incredible. Uh, it doesn't just sound great; it captures distance and direction amazingly well. So you can always tell if a person is near or far, if the person is talking to the left or right of you. You can even clearly map a fight scene in your head by listening to where the punches are hitting, who's groaning, that type of thing. Wow. So, oh, this guy on the left is punching the guy on the right. You can imagine it because you can hear it. You know, or if you're wearing uh, wear earphones, lah, okay. it, it's better than just listening on sp- speakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but of course, you need to use your imagination. You need to do some work with it. It's not one of those podcasts where you can do the laundry or you can type emails at that type of thing. It's more like reading a book. You it's need, not a GRE, lah. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not a conversation podcast. You yeah, really yeah. need to think and and picture it. Uh, so, uh, it's recommended for long bus rides, but not recommended for multitasking. Okay. Yeah, um, the season is as riveting as season one, but one complaint is that by the end, right, mm-hmm. of season two, it becomes too normal of an X Men story. Okay, like season one was great because it felt like True Detective just with mutants, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Season two just feels like oh, this is things I've read or seen in various X Men movies. Oh, there's a big battle, <laughs> Sentinels and mutants and things like that. It's like oh, it's okay lah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've seen this. It's story. not that compelling, lah. It's not that compelling, lah. Yeah. Just, just because it's not so original anymore. Okay. Yeah. So, um, while I rated season one eight out of ten, this is a slightly lower seven point five out of ten. Still just, good. just because of its tropey ending. Lah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next up, I'm gonna be talking about China's box office smash. Oh. The Wandering Earth. Now this. This sci-fi epic is now available on Netflix. Netflix. Um, and it made headlines earlier this year because it absolutely crushed the Chinese box office. It did. Earning over seven hundred million dollars so far. That's US, by the way. Yep. Uh, that's enough to make it the third highest grossing film of the year. And keep in mind that it did that on domestic sales alone. Mm-hmm. But what, how powerful the Chinese market is? Just one point three billion people yep. or whatever is there, right? Yeah. Um, one third of the world is basically China. Essentially, yeah. Essentially, yeah. Uh, the movie. One seven, one seven. One seven, yes. Yeah. Uh, the movie has finally found international distribution. Yeah. Uh, but it won't be adding to the box office global no. totals because it's, it's on, on Netflix. Netflix. But I guess it's good for us, lah. So yeah. we can finally see what's up. 
Uh, the movie is directed by Frank Franz Guo and is based on a novella of the same name by the Hugo Award winning author uh, Liu Shixin. Yeah. Uh, set in a far future where the sun is dying out, people all around the world have built <laughs> giant <laughs> planet thrusters to literally move Earth out of its orbit yep. to sail the Earth to a new star system. Yeah, and how do the humans survive? <sighs> Okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna <laughs> get bogged down in those details. But this 2,500 year journey obviously yeah. comes with dangers. Of course, of obviously. Yes. Uh, and it's up to a select group of young people to solve crises as they pop up, lah. Yeah. Um. Now the premise is clearly ludicrous. Yeah. Don't don't talk about the science, lah. You right? you will know within the first five minutes whether you are gonna buy into this movie mm-hmm. or not, lah. And I understand if you want to check out in the first five minutes because yeah. I almost did. Like, this is it's frankly stupid, lah. But you have to keep in mind that it's no less ludicrous than any of the other disaster films made by Hollywood, like 2012, 2012, or Armageddon, or uh, the Nicholas Cage, uh, Geostorm, Geostorm, you know, oh, yeah. Um, so I'm throwing out that the you know the scientific sense argument, yeah, that that should be out the window. Shouldn't, yeah. It's part and parcel of the genre. Correct. Uh, yeah. If if you want to say Armageddon is great, then you have no yeah. Fuck off. Fuck off. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, sorry, you want to say Armageddon science is great? Yeah, that's what you meant, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but at the same time, also like you know, all disaster movies have troublesome science. Of course, to downright nonsense, la. Because it doesn't exist. But few have taken it this far. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's this huge engines, lah. They call it right? Correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, the wandering of more often than not falls into the very entertainment. Eye popping visual yeah. category. Of, that's what makes it good. Yeah, it's entertaining and it has amazing visuals. It's actually a CG marvel. It is. It's a special effects blockbuster that deserves to be seen on the biggest screen possible, which is why it's kind of a bummer. It's only available on Netflix. Mm-hmm. Um, no matter how familiar the story beats feel, the level of attention to the effects and cinematography has to be praised. Yep. Yeah. That being said, it still suffers from the same problems of similar Hollywood temples. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what, what do you think of this? Uh, it was a solid out first outing lah. I would say for China's. How uh, they've done sci-fi movies before? No, but not at this scale. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. that's the thing. Yeah. So as a of, of this kind of like great big scales, you know, you have the Earth. You, it's just magnificent to see the Earth moving across space, <laughs> you know. And then I mean, it, it makes me laugh, but yes, it's yeah, magnificent. You know I mean? Yeah, and then it's like slowly getting sucked in by Jupiter. You know, all those kind of things. Like, it was just beautiful to watch. I know, I know. Yeah, just you got to turn off the wow. This is so stupid. I know, and wow, then I like how you go the macro scale. You know, of the the the, the planets, mm. and then you go to the you know in, onto the ground in the ice capes of Earth now. Yeah, you know, and all the little little things that they have to do, and seeing China in all this ice. <sighs> Yeah, yeah like, it was fun. It was just a fun movie. It's like. a fun movie. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a, it's a visual marvel. You have to watch it just for the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's stunning because everything else is a trope. Like yeah. the family dynamics mm. between the grandfather and his grandkids were. It's a trope. Ugh. You know, the 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 soldiers yeah. and the commanders and everything was really just a, every other American um, disaster movie. And that, not say American. Like every country that's ever done disaster a disaster movie, movie is like that. La. It's like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even like recently, Singapore had the zombie flick, zombie pura. Yeah. Although that's done for comedy, lah. Yeah, yeah. It pays yeah. the tropes for comedy. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, there are cardboard characters, overwrought sentimentality, yeah. and lots of dull exposition, and a lot of like China pride. <laughs> a lot. I mean, they they should be proud. Of course, of they course. should be proud of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, if all the American disaster movies claim that they're the center of the world, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, why not this one? So, but I think the the pros barely always the con. I barely. thought I was entertained. Yeah, and that's what I want. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it's a six out of ten. Six. Yeah. yeah. Watch it if you got time. Watch it if you got time, lah. Yeah. Not not great. Um, I'm gonna run through my last few ones because okay. they're not so important. Yeah. I will be talking about um Lucifer Nix, which mm. just uh, debuted its fourth season on Netflix. Um, based on DC Comics and Sandman's iteration of Lucifer, um, Fox's adaptation actually brings Lucifer to Earth to get this solve crimes in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. As a nightclub owner, yeah, um, it's a procedural. But despite that, the show actually f- proved itself to be kind of fun and cheeky and sexy, which is what drew its fan base. It may not have been great, but it was frequently entertaining. Um, that's why there was a kind of a mini uproar amongst fans when the show was cancelled by Fox last year. Mm. Uh, thankfully for them, Lucifer was saved by Netflix, which just aired its fourth season earlier this month. And when I mean saved, I mean that in more ways than one because I feel like the show honestly was kind of drowning in the network's twenty-four episode per season format. Yep. Uh, on Netflix, the showrunners did a tight ten, very tight ten, which means less filler, more character development, mm. uh, no more running in place, more efficient storytelling, more mythology. I mean, still not a great show by any means, but it's not boring. 
It doesn't drag. Yeah. And there's something to be said for that when I'm going to be watching Jessica Jones next month. So. It's true. Um, <laughs> I, I, I saw you've seen this. Yeah, I have. I mean, I've been, I've had this strange love-hate relationship with Lucifer, right? It's kind of like one of those things I'll put on while I'm working just to kind of pass the time. Yeah. Because it is charming in its own way. Yeah. Right? Uh, and as much as I hated the premise of it when they first announced it because I'm such a big fan of the original Lucifer comics, right? Yeah. And the whole uh, conceit that you know he's a he's a uh, jazz bartender yeah. and all of that. So right now he's pianist, right? Yeah, he's a pianist, yeah. right? So they kind of like only on the surface bring that over to the TV show, mm-hmm. but it is ridiculous yeah. and it's ridiculous to the nth degree. Um, maybe not in the way that a lot of other ridiculous shows we've talked about in this episode, um, but it's fun and I do feel that ten episodes is just nice, mm. right? Uh, because. Because of its procedural format for the past three seasons, so much time is just spent waddling around. Mm. And I feel like they kind of got to the point. Um, I do wish, I've always wished rather, that they delved into the mythology a bit deeper. Mm. The world building could definitely use some work. Mm. But that being said, in 10 episodes, I think they did pretty well. Yeah, I thought it was a 6 out of 10. Yeah, I mean. same for me. Um, next up, I'll be talking about the fifth and final season of I Zombie, Ooh. which ends not with a bang, but with a whimper. Huh. Uh, this Veronica ask, you know, a Veronica Mars esque wit is what I really loved about yeah. I Zombie. You know, the yeah. detective aspects of the show. It's kind of no longer present because it's now a heavy handed political show about running a zombie nation. Yes. Um, it's all like Trump allegories, and it's not even done as well as Supergirl now. Um, it's lost its sense of fun, which is uh-huh. sad because that's what endeared me to the show in yeah. this first place. Uh, showrunner Rob Thomas was not involved in the production of the final season, uh, which is, I think, the key. La. Um, he's busy, actually busy with the Veronica Mars reboot, so that's why. Um, he, he picked his battles and he picked Veronica Mars about a zombie, and yeah. that's why this last season is not great. Uh, sudden drop in quality, huge oh, no. drop in quality. Give because the last season was so highly rated with the whole twist and all that oh that was two seasons ago last oh, that was two seasons se- ago like the last season was the actual first season of the zombie oh how uh, did that go the, I rated it 6 out of 10 oh, when, so I, when I talked about it in last, last year's, year's episode, episode. Yes. Uh, but this one is a 4 out of 10 no bye bye yeah. zombie bye bye yeah I watched the first 4 episodes and then gave up oh yeah so I didn't even care how it ended okay that's it uh, next up we'll be talking about Guy Ritchie's live action remake oh, of come on. Aladdin oh um, judging from its trailers and promotional materials, yeah. it looks like an unbridled disaster. I'm pleased to report it is not. That is not. Yeah. It's only half a disaster. <laughs> Wait, half? Yeah, half of it doesn't work. Half of it does. Okay. Uh, yes, I mean portions of this is fine and sweeping and epic and nostalgic. Yeah. Especially its gorgeous production design. Yes, and the costumes and the yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. Uh, but even when it's at it, we, I will say even when it's at its best Even when it's at this possible mm-hmm. um, There is no sense of magic and wonder Don't I have. feel uh, um, mm. the, At its worst It is god awful It is uh, Will Smith goes way over the top To compensate for the film's lack of inspiration You can, uh, you can see uh, yeah. yeah But I think like Towards the end I just wish I was re-watching The 1992 animation on, Online or something On Netflix On Netflix, on Netflix. Yeah on DVD I wish I actually owned Yeah Yeah. Um, how would you rate this If you watched this I did Um I enjoyed, uh, like you said, some parts of it. I like uh, Aladdin was fine. Naomi Scott was really, really, really hot. Mm. Um, but yeah, overall, I'll rate this. I don't know why they chose Guy Ritchie. Yeah. But okay, la, um, a 5 out of 10? Uh, I rated this a 4 out of 10. Okay. Yeah, they chose Guy Ritchie because, you know, when you watch uh, Snatch, the, it doesn't it make you think of Aladdin? <laughs> yeah, oh, <laughs> it does. No, it does okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, like Lockstock and all yeah. that. Those are so Aladdin like, you know. Robin Hood. Robin Hood, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, King Arthur. King, yeah, Arthur. King Arthur. So, Robin Hood is another guy. Yeah. yeah. Although, that could have been Garishi also. Who yeah, knows, right? Who knows? Uh, next up, I'll be talking about an animated home video film, digital release. It's not, not actually on our rundown, but I just watched it yesterday. Mm. It's called Batman vs. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, how did that go? Uh, yeah, um, the premise is the turtles go to Gotham City. Yeah. They discover that the Foot Clan is working with the League of Assassins. Yeah. It's a simple, fun, breezy movie that has all the hallmarks of a good crossover. Yeah. Fun interactions between the Bat family and the Turtles. Yeah. An initial misunderstanding that leads to a fight and then they team up, you know. Crossover, oh, crossover the usual shit, the yeah, usual yeah, 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 yeah. And villains that make sense working together. Of course, the Foot Clan and the League of Assassins, they, they For fit. the ninjas. Yeah, Shredder and Russell Gu. <gasps> um, That's so cool. Oh, I mean, the Joker and Harley Quinn all pop up, but they're side characters. Um, the story is light and irrelevant, but it's fun and breezy and enjoyable. It's okay. a 6 out of 10. Okay, that's good. Yeah. All right. Uh, finally, I'm going to be talking about uh, an independent film called Starfish. I was supposed to talk about that next month, but I actually watched it today. Oh, good job. So I thought I'm just going to get it out of the way. Spend okay. like a minute on it. 
It's written, directed, and scored by A.T. White, who is primarily a musician, actually. Never done a film before. Starfish is an art house avant-garde film that feels um, ephemeral, almost like an experimental electronic composition. Um, it stars Virginia Gardner, who you may recognize as Carolina from uh, Runaways. Uh, this film is mostly focused on her with almost no dialogue and is just surrounded by negative space in a post-apocalypse. Mm. It's kind of a slow metaphor for isolation and it's quietly mesmerizing meditation on grief and loss. Uh, the f- plot features a mixtape that can save the world and Lovecraftian creatures and cosmic horrors, but that's all superfluous because this is more of a tonal film. Okay. Um, it's very gorgeously shot and its mood is immersive. That being said... Um, more casual moviegoers might find it too painfully slow or artfully pretentious mm. uh, in its elegant form. Um, I was put in the middle myself in terms of loving and hating it. So it's a 6 out of 10 for okay. me. Um, yeah, that's it for Quick Hits this month, which is actually a lot. Uh, that's why I won't be doing the poll list at the end. But we will be ending with a new edition of Isa's Anime Corner, where our co-host Isa Fung is going to be talking about some of the recent anime that he's seen over the spring season. Yeah. So, um, Isa, what do you have for us? So, um, actually, for spring season, the anime lineup has been pretty stacked. Uh, and the reason for that is there have been a lot of returning anime. So, I'm going to split um, this month's anime corner into kind of like two parts, right? So, let's just get the returning uh, series out of the way first. Let's talk about One Punch Man, right? Yeah. Um, we'll be talking about that more in depth next month. But yeah, let's but just, just kind of a quick thing um, that I think a lot of people who, or a lot of our friends who have been watching it together with us uh, have kind of felt as well. So the one major change is that a lot of people realize that the animation for One Punch Man in season two is not quite the same. Yeah, it's and, by, done by JC Staff, right? Yeah, now yeah. it's JC Staff uh, and it's not Madhouse anymore. And JC Staff is notorious for cutting corners. Mm-hmm. And I think that's been quite apparent, I think, uh, in what we are six episodes in now. Or Seven eight, for last night. Yeah, I seven. Watched yeah. It, yeah. So um, it's a bit of a downer. Uh, but that doesn't really take away from the humor. I think and the writing the s- is still the same. Yeah, the writing important. is still the same. And yeah. I mean, it, it's still based off... Uh, it follows very closely to the manga, which is great. But I do miss the polish and panache mm. right, uh, that they originally had. I do enjoy um, the much slower pace and the focus on one main villain this time around, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to the monster of the week that we kind of got with, mm. uh, with season one. Mm. Uh, so... Uh, look forward to more of that. Um, uh, just like a couple of things that we wanted to bring up just because uh, people have been complaining about it. It's yeah. been very well noted. And when they actually first announced that Madhouse was handing it off to, to JC staff, um, it was quite an outcry, yeah. actually. But just Madhouse because is quite known for one and done shows, right? They are. I mean, it's not the first time that they've handed over uh, stuff over, but you would have thought that a franchise like One Punch Man who did exceptionally well mm. um, would have, you know... Um, Incentivize Madhouse to continue. Also, considering that you know they did the first season of um, Mob Psycho as well. They did the second season of Mob Psycho, and they did. Oh the yeah, which season is why the, the animation was. Yeah, so like they actually opted to go with the second season of Mob Psycho instead uh, of taking on the second season of One Punch Man. We had to sacrifice one for the other. Yeah, which yeah. is which is kind of sad, I guess. Uh, but that being said, Mob Psycho season two, as we've covered already, was fantastic. Great, yeah. Yeah, and um, I mean, I mean, Madhouse is very rarely disappointing. Yeah. In that sense. Yeah. Right. Uh, I next we're gonna talk about um. Some uh a series that has made a return, um like wow it's almost like twenty years actually wow. so I'm gonna talk about the reboot or the readaptation of fruits uh, fruits basket yeah. right which originally aired in two thousand and one mm. right so essentially uh how do I summarize the story it was a manga right yeah it was a manga uh and it's one of those it's one of those like uh absurdist slice of life kind of like fantasy things that was very very popular back in the early 2000s and the late 1990s like Ranma Half and so on and so forth mm-hmm. uh, you follow a disenfranchised girl who ends up um, homeless uh, because of uh, her her life circumstances and she ends up living on an estate of a very well to do family and she later on discovers a secret that the, mem- the male members of this family uh, transform into animals from the Chinese zodiac whenever they are hugged Oh, by wow. a person of the opposite gender, yeah. right? So that's kind of the premise for it, and I think like um, I'm not gonna go like too much into all of that since I mean it's been around for ages. Uh, what I have to say is that I'm actually really enjoying it. I'm not usually into shoujo stuff, mm-hmm. uh, but I do remember watching the f- the first uh, iteration of it uh, way back when and enjoying that. Uh, what 
this new adaptation brings to the table is a much, much, much better uh, production and animation technology. Uh, uh. Technology. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm not even sure if it's technology. Like they just have a bigger budget for it, mm. right? And they are banking on the fact that it is extremely nostalgic for a large part of the anime fandom, mm. right? Uh, so that in and of itself, with combined with a really very heartwarming story. Uh, the style now really sticks and I think like it's worth catching if you have watched it before uh, if you're new to the entire uh, series itself I, I think I still think it's worth a watch mm-hmm. I'm going to give that now it's midway through the season I'm going to give that a 6.5 out of 10 mm-hmm. right uh, next up let's talk about Baki Part 2 hey, now on Netflix now on Netflix uh, mm-hmm. just a couple of weeks ago I think like it dropped down yeah. so uh, I mean Hadi and I were just talking about this recently uh, there isn't really that much to say if you enjoyed Part 1 or if you enjoyed uh, you know the first season of Baki the Grappler way back when uh, it's just more of the same ridiculousness over and over again there are so many what the fuck moments yeah, but they just emptied up, lah. Yeah, and and um, you have <laughs> you have some in, insane revelations about Muhammad Ali. Yeah. Uh, you get a lot more backstory. Uh, Bucky grows up in more ways than one. Yep. Uh, and if you enjoyed anything of the first uh first half of the season that premiered on Netflix, um, you're gonna enjoy more. It, it doesn't disappoint because you're just expecting more of the same. Yeah. So yeah, we'll skip past that. Now on to new recommendations of which we've kind of uh. The first one of which we've kind of talked about before. Yeah. So we're going to talk about a bit about Carol and Tuesday. Yeah. Right. Which is um, the new music anime by Shinjiro Watanabe. Uh, right? Cowboy Bebop Samurai, Samurai Champloo film. Yeah. yeah. And uh, also re- most recently he will be doing the anime versions of Blade Runner. Blade Runner. Yeah. 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 Also does like a majority of Flying Lotus's music videos now. Oh, which is an amazing. If you guys have not seen his yeah. uh, team up with Flying Lotus for the latest music video. It and this is, is actually also a team up with Flying Lotus because he does a lot of the music in the show as well. Yes, exactly. Um, So I haven't really been into music anime for a long while. I think the last one that you could probably call music was Beck, maybe, or even uh, Your Lie in April, which is really, really great if you haven't watched it before. Yeah. Uh, Carol and Tuesday, we basically follow two girls from very different backgrounds who are trying to make it in a music industry on the colony on Mars. Yeah. Right? Uh, so Mars has been, a, uh, the colony on Mars has been established for like 50 years. Mm. And they've been trying to, uh, basically, they, uh, as fate would have it, they meet each other and then they start trying to make their music uh, dreams manifest in a world that is dominated by AI music making. Yeah, um, from what I understand, at least from the first seven episodes I've watched, is that most of the music being made in that world is done by algorithm uh, algorithms. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, and th- that's a big part of the story on yeah. like the f- kind of the flip side, the antagonist part. We haven't really got into m- any major conflict yet, which I'm mm. looking forward to. Uh, but it is an extremely well done, mm. uh, heartwarming tale that is one of my favorite enemies of the year so far. Yeah, uh, for sure. I'm very excited to see how they uh, round out this season. Mm. Um, half a season in, I am. I, it's I'm, actually I'm only a quarter. Sure. It's 24 episodes. That's true. Yes, yeah. and it's so rare to have <laughs> 24 episode se- uh, original Anime, uh, yeah. series like this, right? So, um, Watanabe has been delivering yet again. On something that's very different from what he usually does. Mm. Uh, and I uh, strongly, strongly, strongly recommend it. Yeah. Uh, it's half a season in, but it's an 8.5 for me. Same. I would rate it about an 8 as well. And and, and it might get better because they're going to enter into a tournament arc in the talent show. Oh, yes, the, that's right. The American Idol type show that they have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I was wondering how they were going to do a tournament arc here. Yeah. And I was and like, oh yeah, uh, talent show. Uh, uh. Yeah, I, we, we'll, see, we'll see where this goes. I, I th- it's, it's fascinating, like, the amount of cultural references that they've kind of, like, dropped into mm. that with the whole uh, interview the, 76 questions yeah the uh, Vogue thing the whole Vogue thing uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's so, I mean for people who know what they're referring to it really is like a very very fun little bit of thing that's going on yeah uh, next up let's talk about uh, UFO Table's new anime right so for those of you that know or don't know UFO Table is uh, the studio behind um, Fate the Fate series, right? Ah. So Fate Night, uh, Unlimited Blade Works, uh, pretty much almost all the Fate series anime have been done by UFO Table, with the exception uh, of Clamp doing the most recent uh, one uh, and one other one uh, that they outsourced to another studio. Uh, but basically, they are very well known for a very unique art style. And uh, this time around, with Demon Slayer, 
also known as the Blade of Demon Destruction, uh, I feel like they've kind of hit their peak stylisticness, okay. right? Uh, which is saying a lot considering like the 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 kind of body of work that they've already produced. Mm. So um, we basically follow a a, a pair of siblings, right? Uh, and Tochiro who comes back, uh, they live in the mountains and comes back one day from, you know, trying to sell firewood back in the town and discovers that his entire family has been um, killed by um, demons, right? Uh, with the exception of his younger sister who happens to have turned into a demon. So mm. she survives the attack and turns into a demon. So that sets him off on to a path of um, trying to find a way to turn his sister back, uh, which ultimately leads him to find a mentor. And then we have an amazing uh, episode where they cover an entire two-year uh, training arc, right? Yeah. With the whole like Rocky-like montage yeah, and all yeah. of that um, in a single episode. And it's done like really, really well, wow. which I'm pretty surprised in. Um, so he becomes a demon slayer and that sets him on a path to kind of like rehabilitate his sister or turn her sister back into a human form. Mm. Um, midway through the season right now, this is by far the most stylistic uh, anime mm. um, that I've seen this year, actually. Um, there are moments in time, especially when um, supernatural powers are involved, where the animation style completely changes depending on the power that they're looking about. Uh, the style, um, the stylisticness of it really does add a great deal, even though for the first two, uh, two episodes, I found it a bit off-putting because mm. of how jarring it felt. In uh, But it makes more sense as time goes by. It's very reminiscent of one of my favorite enemies of all time by Clamp, uh, which is um, Magical Girl Madoka Magica, right? Where you have these uh, great sequences that are just from like claymation or they do like paper cut uh, animation and all of that. It has that same kind of feel to it whenever they go into the fight sequences, which are phenomenal yeah. uh, at this point in time. So, highly recommend it. Uh, again, it's only half a season in, but at this point in time, I'm, it's an 8 out of 10 for me. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so, that kind of covers uh, what um, we're doing for Anime Corner. There were a couple of more recommendations that I wanted to make originally after three episodes in, but yeah. now that we're half the season in, I've kind of dropped them. Uh. Uh, notable mentions are... Fairy Gone uh, which uh, originally was on the list but has kind of fallen off after like halfway through the season mm. uh, a, a lot of potential yeah. Um, but yeah let's you know, go with that the other one if you're very big into kind of like these exploration type animes like uh, Magi The Labyrinth uh, which is on Netflix right now um, is Magmal of the Sea Blue uh, which is kind of episodic in its own way but uh, has kind of tapered off on the storytelling side of things. So right. it's a very soft recommend for me. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, that about covers it for uh, this month's genre and quality. Uh, sorry we didn't have a poll list for you this month, but we were a bit overloaded, especially with the overlong Game of Thrones discussion. Yeah. So we are running a bit long. I will be talking about more books and comics. Uh, we, we're not just watching things here. We read things too. I'm literate. We all are. <laughs> I think lah. I think uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I mean, uh, to backtrack on that, we let me run down some of the highlights of the things that we will be watching next month. Um, we'll be talking about Good Omens. All right. The yes. new uh, mini series based on Terry Pratchett Neil Gaiman's book uh, coming out um, soon actually. The May thirty first. May thirty first, which is uh, the day before you listen this. Yeah. Yeah, but we we didn't manage to catch it before the recording, unfortunately. Yeah. We will be also talking about Godzilla Two: King of Monsters, which mm-hmm. looks like an incredible kaiju battle. Mm-hmm. Black Mirror returns for a new season post Bandersnatch with regular Ooh, episodes. With Miley Cyrus. With Miley Cyrus. Uh, we'll be talking about Men in Black International, yep. which stars uh, Thor and Valkyrie. <laughs> Uh, we'll be talking about Toy Story 4 Yeah Which is a huge Huge movie Who's uh, Jordan Peele's in Jordan Peele's also in yeah. uh, Jordan, He feels like he's in Every episode <laughs> this year um, We also Finally will be talking More in depth The Breaking down One Punch Man More in depth Than we talked about yep. Just now yep. It's the second season of it And then for quick hits I'll probably run through Jessica Jones uh, Dark Phoenix uh, Speaking of Dark uh, The German show Dark The time traveling show hey, Is right. back on Netflix Ooh. In the middle of next season yeah, nice, more spreadsheets. Nice. So we're talking about dark. Are we talking about yesterday, which you might not easily think of That's as a genre one, show? A time traveling show. Hey, no, no uh, Groundhog. Alternate dimension show in a world where the Beatles don't exist. He hit his head, right? Then he he, yeah, he and then like he he kind of steals the songs for himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, but that is a genre show. It is. It is. Um, and then I'll be talking about Annabelle Comes Home, which is the co- Con- you know part of the Conjuring universe. Okay. Uh, I'll be talking about I Am Mother, which is a Netflix uh film about a weird nanny. Robot 
that looks scary. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, and also I'll be talking about a weird uh, vampire show. Well, it's not really a vampire lah. He steals. Uh, he eats children's souls. Is he an energy vampire? I guess he is. <laughs> but it's called Nosferatu. But it's spelled N O S four A two. That doesn't wow. sound. It's, it's actually based on a really uh, super acclaimed book by uh, Stephen King's son, actually. Oh wow! Yeah, so um, I w- I was looking it up on Goodreads. He has like a perfect five. Oh people, wow! People really love the book, so hopefully uh, the show manages just manages to live up to it, lah. Okay. Uh, I don't know anything about the book, so the show will be my first I- introduction to that. La. Okay. Uh, I have heard mixed reviews about Good Omens, though, so I'm a bit worried about that. <laughs> I'm not spoiling the no, plot. Know, no, you know. read the book. I did. Yeah, I'm just saying that. Like I've heard varying accounts. Though. I know, but I'm a Terry Pratchett fan. I'm, he's my favorite author. So, mm, but he well, doesn't. I'm he has nothing to do with this show. Yeah, because he's yeah. dead. I know, but I'm, I'm just saying because <laughs> Neil Gaiman is taking it over. I'm, also, I'm really rooting for this because of the demise of American Gods. So yeah, 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 yeah. Let's yeah. see where it goes. But keep in mind also, Neil Gaiman is the, the showrunner for for American Gods season two. <laughs> yeah, who chose that? Which was pretty terrible. So he is the showrunner, uh, from the ground up on this one. Okay, okay. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Um. Till then, I've been Hitzer. I'm Hardy. I'm Isa. I'll catch you next time. Bye bye. Bye.